Right hand. Oh, okay. Right, good morning everyone. Can I welcome everyone to the uh, Suffolk Health and Wellbeing Board? Um, just need to run through uh, uh, a couple of things first of all. Members of the public and press may record, film or photograph or broadcast this meeting when the public and press are not lawfully excluded, provided due courtesy and respect are shown to others in attendance. And this is in line with the Council's published guidance. Can I just ask everyone to please turn off uh, or put your phones on silent, and also, as importantly, your laptops from pinging as emails come in, uh, particularly um, the Surface Pros, which ping the whole time. Um, so, uh, just for the benefit of everyone in the room. Um, can I remind everyone also that we're not expecting a fire drill today, but if one does sound, uh, please leave the building immediately via the fire exit and make our ways to the assembly point, which is at Ipswich Town Football Club. So, um, just uh, like to welcome uh, Mayor, Councillor Mary McLaren, who's here today uh, with us today. So, welcome Mary and Carol Eagles from Citizens Advice West Suffolk. Welcome Carol um, as the new VCSE representative uh, who has replaced John Neal, although John's here. <laughs> 
Welcome. So welcome to you. Um, so we've, we've done a bit of reflecting on the reports coming in uh, to Health and Wellbeing Board, and our conversations have taken place. So what we're going to try and do is, although there are a lot of items on the agenda today, um, uh, and maybe actually in the future we might try and reduce it slightly, the number of items, what we have asked this time is to have shorter presentations. So hopefully that will engage us to have slightly longer conversations and discussions. So I would just ask everyone, we're taking it as given that you've been through your papers, uh, we will have presentations, uh, and we would ask everyone to try and engage and let's uh, take that opportunity to, to sort of get into some of the discussions around the papers that are being presented. Okay, so first item is a public participation session. Um, so we have one question that's been received from Ms. Pam Norris. Um, Ms. Norris is not present, so I'm just going to read out the question. I'm pleased that Suffolk councillors and senior staff now appear to understand the deadly impacts that poor air quality has on the people who live in the county and are looking at the initiatives to prevent, mitigate and avoid this. I am one of 38,882 Ipswich residents that you identified in your reports as impacted by serious air pollution, as I live in Gateacre Road, which is one of the worst impacted areas. I understand this board have agreed to provide oversight of the health impacts on air pollution, form a subgroup to support collective action, which will involve communicating to affected residents and to prevent, mitigate and avoid poor air quality. My question is, can the board please let me know when the neighbours and I can expect to see the first messages letting us know about the serious impacts of air pollution? So, um, Stuart isn't here today, he's on leave, so Martin Seymour is going to provide the response. Martin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Pam Norris for the question and also for acknowledging the ongoing work on air quality, which has been an important area for public health and communities for some time, not least since the summer of 2021 when we published the Suffolk Air Quality Profile. Uh, the profile included up to date local evidence and information for residents and for local partners. Uh, Ipswich Borough Council and environmental health team there have, in particular, have worked hard to report on air quality. Uh, and to connect with local communities, exploring ways to raise awareness uh, and to engage with communities. The upcoming Clean Air Day, which is the 17th of June, uh, also provides a focus for community engagement around the importance of air quality and the need to improve this for everyone. Uh, Clean Air Day will provide information around measures that can be taken to reduce air pollution and promote cleaner air in order to reduce the health impacts on those most at risk. Our public health team will be supporting uh, Suffolk County Council and District and Borough Council efforts on the Clean Air Day response. Uh, in March this year, the Health and Wellbeing Board said we would focus on engaging and working with affected communities, including those in Ipswich. Uh, we are currently working out the best way to do that with our partners, uh, partners such as Health Watch and others around the table today. Um, we aim to, sh to share balanced evidence around air quality and any potential health risks and to work with communities to look at ways to prevent, mitigate and avoid these risks. Uh, we're keen to do this with community involvement and we'll share progress and resulting plans with everyone. Uh, we're clear that air quality and other environmental determinants are important factors for the health and well-being of our population. And although we're at an early stage in the development of this work stream, we are clear that community engagement will be at the centre of the activities we undertake. Thanks very much. Okay, so we'll move on to agenda item two, apologies for absence and substitutions. Rebecca, can you just take us through those, please? Thank you. We've received apologies from Stuart Keeble, who is substituted by Martin Seymour, Sue Cook, substituted by Georgia Chimbani, Lisa Roberts, substituted by Natasha Waller, Steve Jupp, Councillor Mary Rudd, Dr Christopher Browning, and Tracy Bleakley. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, anyone else we need to flag up? No. Nope. Okay, thank you. Uh, declarations of interest and dispensations. Do we need to receive any declarations of interests uh, in respect to the matters being considered at the meeting today? No, none, thank you. Uh, minutes of the previous meeting, these are on page five uh, of our uh, papers. Page five through to page, I think it's 20. 20. Um, is everyone happy that I sign those as a true record? Any points, anyone? No, nope. agreed. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to go straight into the Transitional Suffolk Joint Health and Wellbeing Strategy, 
uh, preparing for the future. I'm going to hand over to uh, Kate Carmichael on this item. That's it. Sorry, sorry. You always do that. I always do that. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Kate Carmichael. You might know I'm a, I'm a consultant in, in public health here. And today I'm going to talk to you about the transitional uh, joint health and wellbeing strategy. Oops, wrong thing. Yeah. Um, you might have asked me, first of all, why a transitional strategy? Why are we doing that? I think for a few reasons. Um, we acknowledge that COVID-19 has had a profound effect exposing poor health and existing health inequalities. And because of that, we actually do believe a reassessment of need is necessary before setting out our, our new priorities. And perhaps even the cost of living crisis has added to that, that as well. We also think there's time needed to let our um, new integrated care systems bed in. And we want them to work with us through the uh, JSNA and the next Joint Health and Wealth Strategy and uh, actually try to work across to think about um, aligning plans and not duplicating efforts. So that's another reason. We also have new policies coming out. We have the levelling up agenda and we've got a health disparities coming out. We want, again, time to respond to that. And, of course, the evidence base for wider disturbance is always growing. And, that, and, and because that's a new vision of the board, we want to give us a bit of time to really think about that. So this year, we're hoping that we have time to work through those changes. I'm not going to talk through all of this because we have to, we're trying to save time. But the only thing to take from this slide is context, vision and focus. That's a really important thing. And that, that should be and also the work we need to get through in 2022 to 23. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the development of the Joint Health and Wellbeing Strategy. Um, the development, when it, when it came primarily from the two workshops we held in the autumn about the review of the Health and Wellbeing Board, um, and that was quite very important. We had a really lot of really good conversation. Um, and from this, we developed a kind of a, strat uh, a draft strategy which has been explored and supplemented by consensus generating meetings held with the Health and Wellbeing Board members, the Programme Office, and the VCSE leaders. Uh, and that gave us a sense to really sense check what we were doing. And that would firm up our priorities, our approach, our cost cutting themes, and of course the vision for the Joint Health and Wellbeing st Strategy. So now, the next few slides, I'm just going to take you through some of the thinking and the, uh, uh, reflects the conversations we had. Okay, um, I think when we were talking in the workshops, people talked a lot about working upstream. We talked a lot about keeping people well rather than waiting until they became ill. Um, we talk a lot about prevention being pr uh, preventative and proactive. Um, and also thinking about the assets we have. So there was a sense that we needed to perhaps lift, le leap upstream as a health and wellbeing board and start to think about how do we stop that flow of problems flowing down into the system and, and, and actually putting pressure on our services. Um, and also the sense of that we wanted to maybe stabilise both need but also demand. And of course that led us to the impacts of the wider deterrence of health. Uh, and the little chap over there, which we tend to call affectionately Ian from Ipswich, um, we wondered about what was really affected his health. And of course, it's the wider determinants. 50% of things that impact on his health are socioeconomic or physical environment. So we know that a focus on healthcare will not solve all health problems and require that system approach. And we just start to, to place our effort where health starts. And that's in our homes, our schools, and our jobs. Uh, we also talked about the iceberg because when we, when we think about health, we tend to think about the bits above the waterline, don't we? We think about the cancers, we think about the diabetes, and we think about the risk factors, all very important things and where we, we need to do a lot of work. But we also need to think about the causes of the causes of ill health uh, and, and go under that water and start to think about education, uh, more environment, uh, employment, a whole range of things which we know actually leads on to ill health in people. And this led us to our approach, which was a very clear focus on tackling the wider determinants for the Health and Wellbeing Board as a kind of very key part of its system working. Um, very much an asset-based approach, working through and with our, with our communities and looking at not just what we haven't got, but what have we got in the system to use. You know, it's our people, our resources. And also that sense of working with and through others to make things. Again, they focus on much more system factors and how actually we work so much better together. These were the priorities we came up with, um, mainly after the 
pandemic, uh, we noticed that mental health has been really struggling with lots of people. People have felt anxious, nervous, isolated. Um, and we all believed in the workshops that actually mental health is really the building block of well-being. But again, we wanted to do something quite different. We wanted to, again, take that leap upstream. We wanted to go uh, build sort of uh, the protective factors in, in, in our approach and, and build emotional and well-being, uh, mental well-being and to put it all through everyone's lives. So rather than just services illnesses, we wanted to stop it happening. Then we thought about work and perhaps that's even become more crucial with the cost of living crisis, really. Um, we know that, health, that work is a determinant of, of health and actually if we have healthy employees, it just doesn't help them and their families. But it actually helps workplaces because um, well employees are much more productive, about 12% more, and actually you lead to more successful economies. And again, this is something that the board wants to really focus on. A voice was another thing that came up, voice and engagement. And if we think about that, you know, we know the assets in our communities are also important in how can we use them. And of course, nice guidance tells us quite clearly the importance of community engagement uh, to health uh, and health improvement. But we know it's complex. So we want to take this first year, this 2022 to 23 year, to build the foundations for this approach. Um, and, and we're asking our collaborative community boards uh, to take the lead on it because it's closer to, it has members which are closer to communities. And also we're going to ask all the other work streams to put in place ideas to uh, look at voice in their own particular work streams. So of course work will be thinking about struggling businesses. And then last but not least is the, is the well-being of children and young people. Um, and this a very, is a very crowded space, and there's many players within it. Um, and we know that there's a lot of people like the, uh, the, um, the CYP board, the ICS, all have a part to play. So really what we're trying to do here is, is really focus much more on the social context of young people's lives, and particularly focus on the mental and emotional well-being of children and young people, and a greater focus on um, child poverty and also adverse uh, childhood experiences, which we talked about recently in the board. They're the outcomes, um, really, really important stuff. Um, what we try to do with these, and what we're trying to do is, as actually work through, is work much more closely together and try to interleave and bring it together. For example, uh, when we look at the uh, public mental health, it's going to be looking at the work of children and young people around mental, mental uh, well-being. Um, also, the work one is thinking about how do we secure uh, mental health well-being at work, again, linking up. And if you think about work, it's also thinking about how do we actually um, help people, uh, children in poverty, and also a sense of worklessness. We know worklessness has great inter intergenerational impacts, uh, and children whose parents are, are workless tend to be neats and also stay neats for longer, um, and that's, that's proven. I'm not going to go through this, a very, very busy slide, folks. Um, but I'm going to point out a couple of things. One thing that came out very clearly in the workshops was the sense of collaborative leadership, that kind of leadership that leads across boundaries. And they felt the Health and Wellbeing Board was really a place where we could do that and work with all our systems, system partners. I think system prevention came up again very closely, and that, that sense of a real prevention, you know, thinking about, you know, uh, not just stabilising demand, which you talk about, but actually working upstream again and trying to say, how do we, how do we stop need? Because if we actually stabilise need, it will stabilise demand and it won't overwhelm our, our services as well. And also reciprocal action, very clearly, that actually we're a system, we have to work together. Um, and we have to think about not duplicating, but build on existing groups and work through them. And again, the Health and Wellbeing Board thought it was very clear that it wanted to do, do that. I picked this slide up as one of the pieces of data, many pieces of data we worked through when we were writing this strategy. Um, I, and I picked it really because in the levelling up um, agenda, uh, there is an ambition about improving healthy life expectancy. It's very clear and it's, it's a very, very important one. And if we look at the past 10 years, we know that that has stagnated and somewhat slowed. Um, and it, in Suffolk, this is not the male slide, but in men it's kind of plateaued. But we, when we look at women, we've seen it actually started to dip down. And that's a challenge to us, it's a challenge to all of us about what can we do to actually improve people's lives. And I think part of what we're doing for saying about the wider determinants will help secure some of that. And this is really our strategy on a, play, uh, on a page, really. Um, 
our, our, our vision is about putting in place building blocks because we know this is just a one-year strategy, but this is the year for taking stock, putting things in place, and, and working. Understand, we work with our partners and communities, um, and to lead, and we want all our people to lead that longer, healthier, and happier lives because that's really important. But again, it, it links up and shows us our approach, our priorities across cutting things around prevention, reducing inequalities greater collaboration, system working, and having those really connected communities, and some of the key challenges, one of which I've, I've mentioned in the past slide. So I'm going to finish with this one, uh, only because it was something that came out of the workshops, I thought it was a really lovely one. It was uh, somebody who mentioned how the Health and Wellbeing Board was in such a good place through its GSA and through the work it does, to actually see health and wellbeing in the round, see people's lives in a kind of holistic way. Um, and I think it also pointed out the potential of the board to make a difference. So thank you, everybody. Thanks very much for that. Okay, so um, obviously we are actually as a board being asked to agree and adopt the joint health and wellbeing strategy, including the proposed approach that's been set out. Um, so happy to open up for discussions, any comments or any questions people may have around uh, the paper before us. Yeah. Tim. <coughs> Thanks, Matthew. I've got one question then a few comments. I'm probably because of my uh, poor knowledge of English, but what exactly do you mean by an asset-based approach? Okay. Please. An asset-based approach. Yes. I mean, it, 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 it's actually about using... I, I, that's why I like the really cartoon, the cartoon, really. It's about... We tend to, in most places, use a deficit-based approach. We, we tend to start with a, a deficit. For example, when people are ill, that's I'm making them better. That's a deficit uh, based approach really and what we want to link into is much more using um, the asset skills and ca capabilities in the system in our, and in our citizens and local organizations and uh, to, to actually focus on that so instead of seeing everything as a problem we look about what have we got to solve the problem around us and work from that um, and of course asset based community development is very much based on the idea of working with communities around that um, it, it really links with ideas of uh, co-production working together um, and actually sharing our experiences to make things better for everybody. Just a few comments, if I may. Um, clearly, if we're going to adopt the strategy, we need to know when there's going to be an action plan, delivery plan, outcomes, who's going to do what, when and where, and time scales and so on. I know we haven't got that today, so I'd be happy to do it with that caveat that we've got that there, because I was very pleased to see reference to the economy, because I do believe that healthy economic growth which will be predominantly led by the private sector, the public sector has an enabling approach, etc. So we do need to do it together. Because uh, from my point of view as a PCC, there's clearly a link between deprivation and higher levels of crime, antisocial behaviour, addiction and abuse. So what can we do collectively that would come in the action plan to make sure we get good, high quality growth yeah. with higher paid, better, more productive jobs and so on. So that's one part. And of course that, if you look at the model in the papers there, um, if you combine income and employment, that is in the top pairing, and um, obviously socio-economic factors have a 40% influence, assuming that model's correct. So for me, that's really, really important for the reasons I've said. And then um, just a couple of other points to mention. One of the huge problems we have in policing is the extra burden because of mental health and the huge difficulties that continue to repeat themselves with the uh, Foundation Trust. And there really does need to be a degree of urgency sorting out what I would regard as a dysfunctional system there. 5% um, of our emergency calls over 100 w a week in the constabulary are all related to pretty difficult mental health conditions, never mind the peripheral ones. And the other difficulty have, we have, um, which would need to be addressed by this um, strategy, those with a serious mental health condition who are taken into custody suites, they're not guilty, processed, we just don't have enough beds for adolescents or those that should be moved to other beds. And we've actually been in a situation, just so everybody knows, I'm not having a go at you, by the way, um, where it's unlawful. They shouldn't be there for more than 24 hours, and at times they have to be there for three days. So this board needs to find out how that is going to be addressed pretty damn quickly because it's a disaster for the individuals. So. There's a few comments there, and I'm more than happy to work with everybody else to see what we can do about it. I think it's a system problem, and, and, and I, I'm an ex-psychiatrist, so actually I do share your pain quite a lot, actually. Mental health is so, so important to people's lives. I'll try to answer all of it. The first one about action plans. We now have set up uh, three priority groups and one uh, 
you know, one we're taking through the, uh, the Collaborative Community Board, and each of those groups is coming up with its own action plan. In fact, they've already met, they're already together, um, and you're going to hear from uh, Public Mental Health here, from uh, Sarah, and uh, just behind me, you've got these two nice gentlemen here are going to tell you about the, the work at health program that we're actually already doing. And, uh, and also, we also need to look at the impact on things, and we actually have the cost of living profile here today to actually help, help illuminate that. Um, obviously, public mental health is dealing much more with the protective factors that keep people from getting mental health, and, and Sarah would obviously talk about that. But we, we know that actually through, through the system, what was really important is we joined <coughs> with our colleagues in the integrated care system to see about these problems and see how we, we, we can work together to actually stop them. So I think it has been pointed out to me this is a problem, but that's how we'll do it, by working together to solve it, I think. Yeah. Is, is that how I answered all your questions? Yes. Thanks. Um, Ed. Um, thanks, Kate. Excellent report. I'm very supportive of it. Um, the one thing I couldn't see was a sort of place-based context. So, as Tim has just said, you know, poor health outcomes in the most deprived communities, yeah. um, economic growth agendas, you know, driven at district and borough council level uh, with other partners. So it, it was just, it may be that's, yeah. that's more in the action planning um, it is phase, but I just don't want to lose that place-based uh, no, context. No, and, and when we talk about uh, really under the listen and engage in the local uh, priority, we actually talk about the um, the communities where people are born, live and work, socialise, have substantial efforts. So in a sense, we've, we've tried to bring it under that and think about healthy people in healthy places sort of approach. Yeah, I, I know what you mean, but, but it is certainly, it, it's in there. Um, and we, are, we talked about the estimates about how much place infects uh, people's well-being and looking at the wider term as vastly as you can see yourself so yeah we we think that kind of sense of assets assets in communities assets in places are what we want to grow um maybe we haven't made it quite pervert um, uh, avert enough but it's certainly in the the, the te text about that and robert thank you very much indeed and thank you very much indeed for um, a really interesting report um just a couple of things that i'd like to raise i'm, I'm both Tim and um, Ed have made mention of a couple of them, but the fact that we're now going to be focusing more um, clinically on um, prevention, which has got to be the right thing to do, we all know that if you prevent something from happening, it's less expensive than actually treating whatever it is that's happened on the back of it, um, which leads me on to the assets and um, wh where is the money going to come from? There is no mention in here about whether there's going to be new money to help those partners facilitate what Tim's been speaking about in trying to improve what's currently there, the physicality of the rooms that they need. So is that going to be moved from um, another place to, to help us facilitate what you're advocating? Or, or have we got to use the money that we've already got and just move it around? Um, well, there is obviously some new money because there's been new money attached to the, the public mental health uh, group, so they're actually working, have some, have some resources, which has been uh, also um, shared with uh, other groups as well. So there is, there is some extra money in that. Um, there may be good ideas, and then we'd have to, of course, take them on a case-by-case -case basis and have a look and see where we can get those um, extra monies. One of the things that I'm doing is also talking to some of our colleagues who uh, work in fundraising and work in other parts of the system to think about where are the pots of money where we can gain, uh, gain support. Um, and certainly the work at Health Group, we're, we're looking uh, quite a lot of funding and where we can gain funding from, not necessarily within the council, but also outside the council. There are always opportunities. And uh, speaking to someone who used to work in the third sector, um, that, that's quite, there's quite a lot out there that we can get hold of. But yeah, it, everything's going to be done as a case-by-case -case basis. We do want to support good ideas, absolutely. Thank you. Andrew. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Kate, for, for, for the report, and I, I'm also very happy to, to endorse it. Um, I think it's important to recognise that, as you have done in your report, that um, the next year is, in particular, is going to be one of great flux, um, and uh, that's why we're going to have a transitional strategy. Uh, I'm interested to know how we're going, going to develop for the longer term through this. Uh, there's going to have to be an element of dynamism about this. Um, but to the, at that end, I think it's important that we keep a very close watch with you on, on how this develops. And if we're looking for an answer or recommendation to point C under key questions, I think we'll be monitoring this on a quarterly basis 
uh, for the time being. I, I, and I think there is a lot of dynamism, I can't quite say it this morning. Um, I think because we've really, really gone out of it and set up our priority groups, and it's not just council, this is, this is wider members. I, I work with the, the working health group, and we have a local businessman, for example, who chairs that group, and we have the Chamber of Commerce who now sit on here, and the LEP on there, and other people in, the, in that section. And we are working quite closely to look at what, how can we work with struggling businesses as well. We've, we've been talking about that. So I think what we're trying to be is really keep our feet on the ground with this and think, what can we actually do? And you're going to hear some of the work from my colleague Sarah and also my colleague Chris behind you about that. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Becky, you were next. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Kate. Um, I too endorse this strategy. Um, however, I do have a couple of comments. Um, firstly, I'm going to um, Ed's comment with regards to place-based discussions. Um, I think the place-based discussions start at the Health and Wellbeing Board. We then feed up to the ICP and feed down to the alliances that way. Um, and that leads me on to Appendix 2, where it's got the wider system context sort of um, complicated diagram there. Um, my concern is you've got the Health and Wellbeing Board floating around there. But there's no connection to the um, ICS or the, uh, any of the ICSs or indeed the ICP on that and I would see as I say the health and well-being board needs to start the conversation and feed into feed down and feed up um, and I feel that's missing from that conversation um, and also when we talk about um, the community voice the um, and listening to the people I think we um, in the same time need to say co-production I don't think there's enough of that when we talk about community voice um, because we can listen, we, it's what we do with what we hear Absolutely, is yeah. the important yeah. thing and that has to be done alongside our communities for order for them to buy into the strategies otherwise you know, yeah. we can listen to the cows come home but we've got to do something with that voice yeah. so I'd like to see almost when you talk about a conversation with the communities it needs to be a co-production I agree, uh, I agree totally with, along I, with that yeah, as well. I totally agree Becky and uh, I, I think that sense of you know uh, bring, bringing this closer together, realising that our communities are our partners in this. They are that, and that's why the assets are there. We can use those assets. We have tremendous ability. We have people who are experts by experience sitting there. And actually, we can draw on that to make better services, to actually grow services together. And again, today, you'll hear some work that, uh, that Linda's been doing around working with uh, local communities, because we're thinking voice is what we want to embed in everything we do, absolutely everything. And I think that's a really case point. So that will be interesting. And I think what you're referring to is something we tried to develop. We did some work with SNE to develop the Suffolk model, um, which is actually trying to define the roles of the IC, uh, uh, Integrated Care Partnership and also the Health and Wellbeing Board. But we are trying to think about how do we join it up better? How do we make sure that uh, agenda items go to the right bo board, but also that we actually share knowledge? And there's some conversations that um, I'm, I'm talking with uh, Susanna Howard about how we can do that better. And I think we need to grow our programme office as well and look a bit more to make sure that actually can sort of is our foundation for underpinning all the work. Um, because um, I think you're right. What we, sometimes it's very hard. We have so much noise in the system that we, we need very clear ways about how we're going to communicate and how we keep each other in, 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 in place. But certainly we're actually looking just at that now. But the Suffolk model is one I think was the start of it. But we're only going to grow that even more about how we all work together. In, in that case, if we're talking about it, I think we need to put that emphasis before we approve it. I want to approve a strategy which doesn't have any connection with, to me, any visual connection to the alliances or indeed the ICP. And I think we need to make that commitment. Okay. No. Mark. Thank you, Chair. Um, I agree about taking an asset based approach, um, but if the issue we've got of poor health, poor mental health and impact of COVID-19 outcomes is that of deprivation, then by definition, those who are living in deprived communities are less likely to have the assets in the right place. Um, and so I think when it comes to what are we going to do about this, we're going to have to think differently about what we've done in the past and move those assets, move that investment, differentially invest with that mission of reducing deprivation firmly in focus. Um, so I, I, I think the challenge is not to the public health 
he is to us um, uh, as partners of the Health and Wellbeing Board to, okay, what are we going to do about that? What are we going to do to support it? If it is about bringing more investment in, are we going to make differential investment uh, that might not suit certain areas over those where the needs are? Um, but we also know that unless we do, we're just going to continue getting the same outcomes for those same deprived communities. And we've got the issue of cost of living, which we're going to come to you later in this board, which means that this is just as serious an issue as potentially COVID-19 has been. The outcomes will be poor for those in poorer communities. We cannot wait as, uh, you know, for... Um, for what are, you know, where, where are the links going to be in this strategy between this board and that board? It is what are we going to do practically as, uh, as, as partners? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, James. Yes, thank you very much, and thanks for the report. Um, I'd just like to make a comment, really, and I don't think it's a necessarily a question, but when we were doing our workshops, we were talking about supporting, supporting each other each of us individually within our own organisation supporting each other. And coming to, to Tim's point, uh, where organisations are having difficulties, um, that's where we support them as a whole, the whole system supports to, to help them. But that also means that organisations, when they are in difficulty, has to open their door and let people help. And that is really challenging, as we know. When organisations get into difficulties, you kind of put your head down, try and sort out the problems that you've got. But I think what we must do, and I, we do do, and I know over the last two years it's been very evident, but we've got to articulate that the system is there to help every organisation in the system, yeah. and we were wanting to ensure that those in the system that are having difficulties, if I can put it that way, really welcome others to help them to, to, to sort the difficulties out, because they are so large, that in fact one organisation can't sort them. So it's just purely a comment. That, but I do like that word supporting and it is giving support across to other members. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank yeah, you, Chair. I think that's a really good point because it's about a system, isn't it? And for the system to be healthy, all the bits of the system have to be healthy. Uh, and that means us all offering help and support and, and, and really good, you know, that critical friend approach, isn't it, sometimes, to make sure we can help people out of the sort of difficulties they're getting. So, yeah, I agree. And we did talk about having some create and reflect uh, sessions with the Health and Wellbeing Board, uh, and maybe that's something we could also take back to one of those, which uh, I think is on my list of things to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Wendy. Thank you. I just, just wanted to pick up on a couple of points. Um, and thanks, Kate. Really great report. But also, I think I'd share the urgency around some of the thinking and also that we really need to think differently because the problems we're facing, if we, we keep doing what we've always done, as Mark said, we're going to end up with what we've already got. Um, Tim's points about urgency of some of the issues that we're facing. And they're really unpalatable truths, aren't they? Really difficult truths. Um, I'm struck by the the idea that really we're looking at another wave of the pandemic in a lot of different ways around the cost of living. And one thing that I'm thinking about Kate's whole system, I think it's really important that we remember that our whole system isn't just the people and the organizations that are in this room, it's the residents and the people yeah, that we work for. Yeah. And we saw that really clearly in COVID, didn't we? That actually it was a completely new situation. It took a completely different approach that we all had to change our behavior and we all had to take responsibility. And the key thing I think for, that I'm concerned about, I guess, in the middle of this is about transparency and how we, how we speak the unpalatable truths in a system that has such political blockers or responsibilities. And, that's, and we had to do that in COVID. We had to be really clear with people about the level of risk and the level of responsibility and about moving, um, as Mark said, moving our assets around in ways that perhaps we wouldn't have done before. And I just wonder, for me, in this, in this report, that's quite a central question. How do we have the really difficult conversations? And I think the question that raised around air pollution and air quality kind of reflects that. How, do we, how can we be really honest with people about where they are and, and, what, and what they can do? So I think if we can't address that, 
it's going to be really hard I to move forward. I think that's a great point. I think that transparency, that honesty between colleagues, because we're all friends here. We know we're, we're colleagues, and I think that's why one of the things that came out, if you look at our, our, our sort of principles, one of the things we put down around a challenge was be ready to have difficult but respectful conversations in pursuit of health and well-being. And I think that was something that came out of those those workshops in the autumn that we wanted to have, that we wanted to have those sort of conversations with people. We want to be honest. And again, as James was saying, we support you through it. But 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 sometimes we need to also think what our behaviours are like and how do we actually get that sort of thinking to the forefront, don't we? But I think it's an absolutely good point. If I could just follow it, Kate, I mean, it's also about how we those conversations leave the building. That's the key, isn't it? <laughs> I think it's about how those conversations leave the building. I think we often talk about how we talk to each other, but how do we talk to the public? Yes. Yeah. And I, I think that's why I think it's it's a very complex way, isn't it? And we don't want to be um, we don't we don't want to be tokenistic or anything. We want to actually make sure we do it properly. And that's why I said this year has to be that kind of foundation where we start to talk all together about how we're going to have those conversations with certain groups. Um, for example, we've been talking at the, the health and work group just about having conversations with struggling businesses. Um, there's a care sector, which we know is really struggling, the people in that sector, they're really damaged. Um, but again, there's also seldom heard communities. Uh, and some of the things we were talking about, I remember during the workshops, was having maybe areas where we take as almost community to practice, where we know there are deep-seated problems, and maybe putting more effort and time into those as well. I think Waverley came up as one of those, right? Okay, so what I'm hearing, and I th think I've got this right, so do come in if you think, but there is generally, there is to absolutely support for the uh, strategy um, and the proposed approach. Uh, we need to tweak it around the points that Becky made on the appendix, just to show that, to give clarity around the links. Um, we need, we want to see, uh, I think going back to Tim's point, you know, next steps, uh, when, timings, how we're going to pull it all together. Uh, it is a much, it, it, it is a, it, you know, there's a lot of work to do. We did it in COVID, I, I think Wendy's right, you know, in COVID, actually everyone just rolled up their sleeves and moved forward at a pace. And I think that's what we're saying here. We've got to see things moving at a pace. Um, but when will the, 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 the next sort of actions and the outcomes from all those streams, when, when is that going to be sort of coming forward with some sort of documentation well, for us? As I say, we've got, we've got my colleague Sarah here who's going to talk about the public mental health work that's been undertaken. Um, and I've put, behind me, I've also got Chris, who's going to be talking about the health and work, and Richard Brown, who's our chair, is also here today to actually discuss it with you as well. So we have got, we are already working on these, is what I'm saying. We, we didn't just start, we didn't stop when the while we were writing the strategy. We ploughed on, really, to get these things done. Because I think one thing that came very clearly out of the, again, out of the, work, the workshops, well, people, we need to get on with things. We don't want the conversations to stop at the door. We want them to continue. How do we sustain that? And I think that became very clear, and that's why we set up the, the workshops. And of course, we've heard from Sharon recently about the adverse childhood experience and some of the work that's been done there. So all these areas we want to do, they are being progressed. Um, and we're ha you know, we will come back either in person or as, as kind of reports, that information bulletins, um, to let the, the board know that we're really Thank trying you. to get this done on your behalf. Tim, you want to come in? Yeah, j just a couple of points. I think that, that, that this is fine. I mean, in some ways, this is not meant to sound wishy-washy. It is about giving, um, you know, the whole population of Suffolk some real hope that we're going to make a difference because there is a degree of cynicism out there, be it um, political leaders, and I will say that, including myself, um, you know, people, we've heard it all before. And that's why this action plan is crucial. We've got to give people hope that we will help those in areas of deprivation, like Mark was saying, because if we don't deal with that, it's going to bring us all down. And there's a, there is, I suppose, a sort of an issue of fairness and common decency about that. And, you know, we have got huge potential here, and I do think linking this in with the um, um, Level 2 county deal, there's potential there. Um, obviously, it's early days on that yet. But there is an opportunity there, and we've got to grasp that nettle and deal with it. And if you think of some of the major inward investment programmes that are coming largely from the public sector, and I'll be controversial, yes, I as well see that if it goes ahead, which I think it will, huge potential there. We've got the Third River Crossing up at Lurstoff, and some people may not be aware, but the proposals for the huge expansion of High Point Prison, where the capacity is going up by over 50%. Now, I don't know how many pound notes are going to be involved in that, but it'll be a lot. So we've got to make sure that we are ready as a county 
for the jobs, the money that maximises the spend here in Suffolk. And by the way, we could also do a damn sight more on our collective procurement across the public sector to really ramp up the social value. Are we really concerned about the Suffolk and UK economy or do we just pay lip service to it? That could make a real difference. We've got huge potential here with food and drink. I would say that with my farming background, I know. Um, but there are other things as well. You know, we do have an innovative county. We need to really boost it up. You look at Adderstall Park, you look at logistics, the Freeport. I mean, so really, getting this strategy motoring, I think is going to be um, absolutely crucial. And it could be really, really influential. So I'm right behind it. I've made my views clear. So um, thank, you, thank you, Tim. Let's get on with it. Yeah. And I think social value is particularly interesting. We d and we brought it to a board here, didn't we, about social value. Uh, um, uh, my colleague, Katrina Brown, is working quite hard on that. And I think something you also said, which I think those the idea of recovery, because um, we in the report we talk about recovery, not just recovering from illness, but recovering a life worth living. And I think that's what the people of Suffolk want after the pandemic, don't they? They want that sense of where do I go? How can I get back to a better normal, perhaps? Yeah. I'll bring Arthur in, and then I'm going to probably move on, unless anyone else who hasn't spoken wants to come in. Arthur. Thank you, Matthew. I, just an ask, I suppose, and, and people may disagree with this, but. I'm not interested in progress against the report or against the, the strategy coming to the board. Uh, I think that needs to come to the board outside of the meetings rather than inside the meetings. What I think the board needs to focus its time on is the performance and the, and the performance reporting and the, not the progress updates, not what are the groups working on, but what's working and more importantly what's not working in terms of delivery against the strategy. And I think there's a danger that we might hear a lot of stuff and it's all good stuff but it's just stuff, rather than necessarily getting the best out of the board to enable the board to function as effectively as possible. And so when those things do come through, that they come forward in a structured way as well. Because um, I know you made the comment at the beginning, Matthew, in terms of the reports. There's a lot in these reports, but it's not very structured. And that makes it quite hard to work through for individuals and see the system. The system's incredibly complicated. The art is in making it simpler for ourselves and for the rest of the system as well. Yeah. Could, I, could I just say, Chair, we were thinking about bringing more information bulletins, actually, after so, because we don't want to overwhelm the board just with this, but we do know that you need to be kept up to date with things, and if we need help. And, of course, there could be uh, things like sponsors or champions, which the board, um, that chairs can actually speak to the board members about, which is something we would strongly, uh, strongly endorse, actually, which would be really good. So can I take it, then, that we are happy to agree and adopt it, but with tweaks, um, the tweaks that have been picked up, I know there's note-taking going on. Kate, obviously you've heard those. If we can just put those in and maybe recirculate it, just to check that's what people had in mind. Yeah. I think at pace is the message you're hearing. Uh, loud and clear from the whole board. So thank you for that. Yes, thank okay. you. Thank Is everyone just, yes, Jessica. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm not officially on the board, but um, so I just thought I would um, <clears throat> speak now that the board has spoken. I just wanted to make a, a really quick comment on the um, question of equal inequalities within, within the strategy. Um, yesterday at our scrutiny meeting, we looked at um, the poverty reduction strategy. And it's clear that there's a difference between poverty and deprivation. And um, poverty is a very real thing that has come to us like a lightning bolt almost very recently. And I think this transitional strategy really needs to address the effect that poverty will have in the next year or two. Yes, and, and actually one of the things we uh, talked about is actually making sure we, we actually address some of the issues around the poverty reduction plan. Yes, it's, it's in, in there. And certainly we'll be hearing a bit more about it today as well, Jessica. Yeah. Okay, good. So can I just have a general affirmation that we're happy to agree and adopt with those changes that agreed? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank okay, you. so we'll now move on um, to the next item, uh, which is the... Uh, Public Mental Health uh, Programme update, uh, hand over to Sarah Dunning-Hall. Sarah. Thank you. So I just wanted to, to start by reiterating the aim of the Public Mental Health Programme um, and, and the allocated comp funding that goes with it. So again, just to reiterate that this is about the protective factors for good mental health. and, and just to again say that we're talking about upstream from the clinical mental health services, so just keeping everybody well in their communities. Um, 
sorry, I've done the same as Kate. <laughs> so previously we've outlined um, five key areas that are guiding the progress of the programme and I'm just going to run through really briefly an update on each of these areas. Um, time's obviously really limited so I'm just going to give a very brief update um, but happy to answer questions as well. So the area I wanted to spend probably the most time on is the measurement aspect of wellbeing because I think this is a big part of the programme um, and it will guide all of the other work moving forward. Um, and actually, I think that measurement and planning would probably better describe what we're talking about here because it's substantially more than just data collection. Um, and just to add that these plans have been agreed by the Public Mental Health Steering Group, which has that kind of cross-sector representation on it. So there's two phases of this work, um, and these are based on building and expanding the Suffolk Mind Emotional Needs Audit, which we've previously um, discussed captures information on the emotional and physical needs that we all need to stay mentally well. Um, and John, who I think most of you know, has come along just in case there's any specific questions on this from the board as well. So the initial phase is about working with the University of Suffolk to ensure that the survey um, that's being used to capture information on the emotional needs is academically robust. And what I mean by that is that we have real confidence that it's reliable and valid as some of the sort of the well-known tools that capture information on well-being, so um, ONS and the Warwick Edinburgh. But um, why, why do we want to use this model rather than those? I think the, the key really is that the Suffolk Mind model give us, gives us the finer detail, it gives us the direction to sort of plan action as well, it doesn't just give us that measurement. Um, and I think that we also have a, a, a wealth of data that Mind have captured already through the pandemic so it can kind of give us that tracking over over the time and we can see what's what's going on so this by academically validating the tool will also have a legacy once this year's funding comes to an end we'll have a tool that collects information that we can use to plan evaluate and also academically publish all of the work that we're doing across Suffolk So the second phase of the measurement and planning is about using that validated tool to expand data collection so that we have information from across the entire Suffolk population. And this will guide our current working, but also work far into the future. Um, but like I said, it's, it's not just about having data. And I'm just going to quote um, Professor Valerie Gladwell from our steering group, who said that, that data is useless unless it's usable. Um, and I think this is what we're really trying to, to aim for with this. Um, the, we're trying to translate the information that we collect into action. So the data we're collecting will be analysed um, and then it will be used as the basis to train and run workshops with local community leaders and this will be across target population groups. So this may be populations of interest but also picking up on the place-based aspect of geographical locations. So we'll pick up on some of those key populations and look and plan into the future and how we can how we can kind of longer term support the well-being of these populations. This element of the work will also establish a longer term partnership between MIND and the University of Suffolk and that will support the kind of ongoing monitoring, evaluation and action into the future. So they will continue to do this work, not on, on this scale, but they will continue to sort of do, do this action planning and monitoring as their sort of business as usual uh, through that partnership. So I think I've, I've covered everything on this slide. This just gives us the outcomes that we're planning from that measurement and planning part of the work. So the next area of the public mental health programme is about the understanding and skills. Um, and this is the area that the Best Work and Health Group are leading on. And we're working really collaboratively with colleagues behind us. Um, and they've been leading on the development that, and, and Chris and Richard are going to go through all of those plans in the next agenda item, so I'll, I'll leave it to them to, to give, pick that up on detail, but just to say the two groups are working really closely, and like I said, some of the comp funding we're looking at supporting the work that they're doing for the mental well-being of workplaces as well. So the third area of the public mental health programme is about that targeted support and enablement and this is about enhancing and developing current provision, um, those assets that Kate was talking about within communities um, to match the specific needs and, uh, and as I've said this will be guided by the work from the measurement section of the work um, but there are key areas that we're progressing already. 
So physical activity, there's a subgroup looking at what's out there. They've pulled together some potential projects that we can look to support. And these include things like reboosting the daily mile in schools, um, looking at local sessions to look at social isolation and loneliness in rural areas, um, and also looking at pathways into established clubs that are already out there. These are all being reviewed and decisions will be made on these in the next few weeks and where we can support. Um, plans are also being developed about how best to support the well-being of children and young people, how best to um, mark COVID and memorialise COVID across Suffolk, um, and also about looking at the infrastructure to inform what, what's out there. We've had feedback, especially from the voluntary sector, that says there's actually quite a lot out there that supports well-being of people, but people don't always know about it. They don't know where to look. So we want to look at how we can bridge that gap between the two. And then also we're looking at ways we can best support carers. Um, and we're talking to those that have developed the carer strategy and seeing how we can best link into that and picking up from the COVID recovery work, the, the clinically extremely vulnerable who are still at risk of isolation and loneliness and seeing how we can look at that population and support. So in addition to the targeted support, the, the fourth area of the programme is about what can be done county-wide across Suffolk um, to support wellbeing. And again, plans are being developed and reviewed and we'll hopefully start with these very imminently. Um, but there's hopefully going to be a, a big focus on this around sleep because we know that sleep quality has been significantly impacted throughout the pandemic. And then finally, we plan to develop the 10-year strategy. We've discussed this at the steering group. Um, but there's a, there's a really strong feeling that the strategy should be informed by this current programme of work that's ongoing, especially the measurement and planning of wellbeing. We're doing this kind of significant collection, this significant population insight, um, and it was felt that that should really form part of that strategy. So the, the, the feedback from the steering group and the proposal is that this will be developed throughout the programme, throughout this financial year, and there will be a strong emphasis on co-production through that. So the next step with this is that we are planning with health, with the support of Healthwatch to run some workshops with kind of key stakeholders and people of the, out there in the population to start working and, and co-producing that strategy. So really sorry to run through that all really quickly. Um, it's just to kind of give you the, the, the top line at the moment. Um, but the board is asked to just note the progress and feedback on the indicative spend outlined. Um, and it would be also, as Kate mentioned, really helpful if the board could um, provide or, or um, put forward a sponsor for this work, just so we can get that regular input without having to keep coming and updating on the detail of things. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, Andrew, you want to kick off? Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm, I'm interested, uh, clearly I'm, I'm supportive of the, of the um, uh, in, in initial phase. I'm interested to know about um, measurement uh, of well-being um, and how we went about or are going to go about the um, data collection uh, and how we've approached or are going to approach those 23,800 individuals and how they have been selected I let John so that it is the, the statistically sound. Yes, statistically sound is the, is the key word there. That's, that's uh, why we want to do this and get so much data in. So Suffolk Mind already has around about 11, 11 or 12,000 pieces of data from the population of Suffolk that we've gathered over the last few years. Uh, but it's all been gathered online. It's all been uh, promoted through social media advertising, for example, uh, and then topped up with particular organisations that we've worked with from a workplace wellbeing point of view. So it's not demographically representative of the, of the population of Suffolk, and that's what we want to, to shift. So um, each, each of those pieces of data costs a bit of money because we use a piece of software called Qualtrics, which is like SurveyMonkey, which most people are familiar with, but with bells and whistles on top and allows you to, to scrutinise that data a lot more um, and do a lot more with it. And as Sarah just said, um, it's, your data is useless unless you can use it. Um, so what the and what a big part of the cost is is getting people human beings on on the doorstep uh, in town centres village centres actually talking to people talking to the population of suffolk um, and encouraging them to to fill in the, the emotional needs audit so what we've got at the moment is online only and what we want to move to is more of an analog way of, of collecting some of that data 
uh, also working with some partner organisations in ethnic minorities, for example, but also on the ground in certain communities that we're going to try and target a bit more, so those areas of, of higher deprivation, for example, where we definitely want to make sure we've got lots of, of data so that we can, it's more representative overall and we've got more that we can use at that local level. Yeah, I mean, I, just, just to say, John, I think that that is absolutely vital that we are, you know, are going to do that that face-to-face -face direct experience, and I know you know that, but, uh, but I fully endorse that approach. Can I just ask, Sarah, did you have a sponsor in mind, or are you looking, has one been a kind of, do we have one in mind? No, <laughs> I haven't lined anyone up, so. Um... So, uh, was that, were you volunteering, Andrew? Was that yeah, in yeah. <laughs> first off, first off, they always say. Uh, Becky. Thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank you, Sarah, for the presentation. Um, I agree with um, Andrew with regards to um, the resident's voice. Um, I have the advantage or disadvantage, however you want to look at it, by sitting on two health and wellbeing boards, one for Norfolk and Waveney as well. And um, one of the most powerful presentations of the last health and wellbeing board was listening to people being recorded, talking about their, what they believe good mental health is for them um, and, um, and their lack of knowledge of assets available to them within the community as well and that was very powerful and that sort of sent home um, some of the questions that we were being asked in the mental health strategy um, so I think that's really important um, and I suppose you'd expect me to say the next thing but um, I it might not be implicit in the um, papers and I accept it's mostly an area which links into quite a lot of the other areas but older people's mental health is not actually sort of outlined there. Um, I'm thinking around, you mentioned loneliness with regards to um, connecting people with physical activity. Um, but I think particularly coming out of COVID, a lot of older people are still petrified about going out into the communities and mixing, um, and th that's come from their isolation. Um, and and I appreciate the work we're doing with the working age adults, but I think I'd like to see a bit more implicit around older people's mental health as well. Thank you. Um, no, completely point taken. And I think one of the things as well that we haven't had time to outline is the, the groups that we will focus on with that data collection and measurement, and we haven't kind of fine-tuned that into what we will look at. So um, the clinically vulnerable may fall into that group that we can really, and also the older people as well, so thank you. Thank you. Tim, you're next. Um, thanks, Matthew. Yeah, I'd entirely endorse um, Becky's comments there. I'd written down here, what about the demographic changes we're expecting for the next 10 to 15 years, an aging population, more real challenges in society like dementia and so on. There are two areas I would, um, uh, not for a discussion now, but I think, or I hope, that the um, survey will look at. We have a very large um, number of military veterans in the county, and I do know from personal experience of some of the um, voluntary and uh, charitable organisations we've supported, that is a big, big number, and there's variations, etc., within that. And the other area that often gets overlooked, and I'm, I'm not just talking about the prison population, but those who've been in trouble, offenders, and you've got a huge range there, but we do know that most inmates, I think it's over 50% of inmates, actually have had severe mental health problems, addiction, psychosis, illiterate um, capabilities and, and so on and it's not just about those who've been detained you also if you could liaise with probation just to find out a bit more we now have a dedicated probation, um, probation officer called Henry Griffiths um, they could give a much wider context of some of the challenges they have there because again if we're going to make sure this is a comprehensive survey we need to make sure those particular groups of people um, are included to get a good rounded view and then we can obviously develop the action plan as you say here and um, see what we can do. I fear it's going to cost a whole lot of cash of course, um, always the problem, um, but that's, we'll find out what needs to be done and then we'll have to see what we can do about it. But I certainly welcome this, so thank you very much. Um, Arthur, you went. Thank you Becky. Uh, there's several references in the report to the word local, so local action plans, local stakeholders, local leaders. 
just help me in terms of what, what's your version of local? How local is local, I suppose? Because clearly below the level of Suffolk, that could mean a multitude of different things. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think that was one of the issues that, that John was mentioning about so the data that is that we've already got. Actually, we can the level of data we can only break it down to district and borough level. And on a well-being, things vary a lot more than just at district and borough level. So what we want to do is really pin down into uh, towns or even kind of splitting town level. But again, it, it will be dependent on what that data is telling us. So if it tells us that there is a problem across a town, we can work at that level. If, it, if it's pinpointing that there's a problem with a specific community at a district and borough level, we can, and that's, we, we can't decide that until we get that data to look at, but completely this is about pinpointing. And we will have to prioritise. There, there's a lot of funding here, but we can't answer all of the wellbeing problems across Suffolk. So the point is that we can use that data to really strengthen our approach and, and kind of focus down where it's really needed. James, you were next. Yes, thank you very much. I'd also um, initially like to support what Becky was saying, that it is about the isolation of older people. And I've been in a number of meetings where people have said, that actually, my mother doesn't want to go out. So I think that I would just preempt what I'm going to say. Uh, and, and the second thing is, is about, um, and obviously in my position, with children and young people. And the comment we've got here on page 75, that one key theme already identified affecting the well-being of young people is bullying. Well, that's not new, is it? Um, the way people are bullied and through social media may be different, but you know, um, that isn't something new. It's been going on for years and years. And that brings me to my point of where John's involvement in collecting this data and asking people for their experiences. One thing that you're going to have to be able to manage in, a, in the most appropriate way is we've been telling you this for the last 10 years. And therefore, we've got to have that ability to be able to understand what we already know and what is going to be added to it. Otherwise, you are going to have that difficulty of people, you know, we are meant to know what needs to be done. I say we collectively, not me necessarily, but the professional. So that's just one bit of caution that actually um, you may get that little bit of backlash. But um, it is... Once again, going to see what works, what did work, and do more, in, more of what does already work rather than reinventing it. So it was just purely a comment. I don't think there's anything to come back. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for that. Uh, Carol. Yeah, thank you. Um, with the targeted support and enablement, I just wondered um, how, once you've identified the things that need to happen, you will select the organisations that you're going to work with and with the VCSE uh, figure in that? Um, yes, they definitely will. So we're working um, with a lot of the VCSE networks, um, so um, the VASP networks, and we're starting to, kind of, we're talking to them at the moment about kind of the ways they feel we need to communicate best with them. Um, what we are looking at, at ways of kind of, like exactly what you said about putting out ex what, what we're after and getting responses back from them in, in kind of a, a bidding situation where people will come up with proposals to, to target those things. So we want to broaden it out. We've got, so for the phys physical activity, it's a prime <coughs> example of that. We've got some proposals coming from some of the, the usual players at the moment. What we want to do is really get down into the communities and look at how we can get some of that, the VCSE involved in that and get some of those as well. So we're just going through that process and then we will cascade the information through those networks so we can make sure that we're definitely involving everybody. Thank you. Uh, John. Um, thanks, Chair. Uh, I think what was going through my head much has been, uh, been mentioned, so this is probably more of a comment now. Uh, as I did raise my hand, I thought I'd best uh, make comment. Uh, I think uh, we support the direction of travel. Uh, the emotional needs audit, uh, I think this board has always agreed, is very important. And I think what I'm hearing, particularly from Councillor Reader and Councillor Reid, um, this methodology should, it should be give us a good benchmark based on what is going to be a very important, robust methodology. We don't need to be hearing what we already know. They should build on what we already know. And importantly, should uh, give a good benchmark for uh, the future programmes that we're going to be talking about around um, comp funding. So I, I sort of see this as a, a sensible 
way forward and it's, it's the important thing is that it is robust methodology uh, building on what exists not just recreating what exists and I think from what I've heard that's what I'm hearing thanks John uh, Robert yeah thank you very much indeed um, <clears throat> It, it goes without saying that we're going to obviously, and thank you for the report, by the way, it goes without saying that we're going to encourage innovation in moving this forward. But can we not forget those organisations that we've already used in the past um, to help us with um, projects like HAF, the holiday activities? And there, there are organisations out there that are keen and able and willing to help us achieve what we're trying to achieve here. So just making sure that we keep on board all those organisations to help us achieve it. And then managing the, um, the reporting mechanism afterwards so that we, as an after set, get to see what's been achieved rather than how you got to where you were. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I th and I think that's, that's what I was trying to sort of explain about getting out to those wider networks so we can make sure everybody out there, all of those voluntary sector organisations, know what we are trying to achieve and have, has a part to play in that as well so equally those organizations that have done things and um, we want to build on on some of that as well picking up on your point about the outcomes that's something we're, we're working with the university of suffolk as well in in terms of this partnership to, to start building a kind of a clear picking up on kate's point the clear kind of action plan with the outcomes aligned as well so we can kind of hold everyone to the account and and look make sure we're feeding through to the outcomes as well Okay, um, I think that's everyone. No one else wants to come in. So if I look at the recommendations or the actions we're being asked to take, uh, obviously we, we've all supported the progress of the programme and we've given our feedback. Um, and obviously we're all supportive of the uh, actions, sorry, the, continue to work with partners to progress the actions. That's all fine. The final bullet point is a board, uh, a board sponsor. And we haven't had any volunteers. So... I don't want to put anyone under pressure in the room, but, oh, thank you, Andrew. <laughs> there we go. My notes did have Andrew question mark, so that's, that's perfect. <laughs> so thank you for picking that up, Andrew. Um, okay, so the, so the board's happy with that, and, and thank you for bringing that uh, very important piece of work to us. Um, we look forward to further updates in due course. Okay, so we're going to move straight on to supporting good health at work, progress recommendations from the Best Health and Work Partnership. Um, and we have, uh, obviously, Chris By Pyburn, who's the Public Health Manager, and Richard Brame, who's the Chairman of the Best Health and Work Partnership. So, hand over to you. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here and to have an opportunity um, to talk to you. Um, so I know some people in the room, but certainly not all. So I'm Richard Brame. I'm a senior director at Willis Towers Watson. Uh, I have responsibility for the big black building uh, just around the corner uh, where we employ 1,500 people. Um, so big employer, big company. I've been involved in um, business for nearly 40 years and been a business leader for over 20. Um, I would state, and I'd like you to know, that I am Suffolk born and bred, despite the fact that we, I work for a, a global uh, insurance broker. I've always lived in Suffolk, always worked in Suffolk. I'm very connected to a lot of um, local organisations. I sit on the um, Suffolk Chamber Board in Ipswich, uh, and I work closely with a number of other companies and with organisations such as uh, Suffolk Mind. So it's been really good to take on the role as the chair of the Best Health and Work Group um, I actually think we have a fairly simple key objective, um, at least it sounds simple, which is to improve uh, workplace health. Uh, I think, you know, if we can encourage and help employers and employees to lead healthier works, uh, work lifestyles, um, we can improve productivity and therefore we can improve Suffolk itself, which is um, key to what we're trying to achieve. Um, Healthier employees are, without any doubt, um, more engaged, um, and they're a better, more productive workforce, and they are then better people in the wider society. So there's an awful lot I think we can achieve by looking at fulfilling that key aim. Um, there's been a lot of talk I've, I've heard today about getting on with things and urgency. Well, we're ready to do that. Um, so as a group, uh, we've met. 
and that's people from the, the private sector, the public sector, uh, and from uh, local organisations uh, as well. Um, and we've got some proposals that, that Chris uh, will take you through, and I know the papers have been circulated. We've discussed those with the uh, Public Health uh, Steering Group, uh, and we have their support. Uh, and a lot of this is not new. It's based on things that we've been looking at in the past, uh, again, with, with Suffolk Mind in the pa recent past, too. Um, so we've got some proposals we want to put, uh, discuss with you today. There are things that I think we can get on with pretty much now, uh, and I think we can make a difference. Um, I will apologise to you, uh, because I have to leave very shortly, so I'll leave Chris to speak, and he'll probably end up taking all the questions, not me. Um, but I wanted to, to be here so that you could see that you know, there is business representation, and this is really important to me and to business. Uh, and this is us working together with a lot of the organisations and the people in the room uh, to make this happen. So with that in mind, um, Chris. Thank you, Richard. Um, and it's great just to say that Richard is on board and supporting as the chair of that partnership as well. Um, so we know that um, being in work, having a good job, is one of the main determinants of good health. And I should emphasise that's in good, having a good job, not just a job for its own sake. And employers that invest in workplace health create a virtuous cycle in which their staff are better motivated, more productive, and there is a reduced sickness absence rate as well. And that's important for all the things we want to achieve because that reduces the productivity gap that we know we, we have in Suffolk. And it's generally very good in terms of inclusive growth that supports everyone um, as well. But we know that the last two years have created some challenges. They've changed the context in not just how we work, but often where we work as well but there are opportunities within that as well. There are bigger issues as well. We know that with an aging population in Suffolk, people will be working, living longer, but also working later into life as well. So how can we make sure we have the right mixture and balance of roles and jobs that are suitable for them as well? How can we invest in having the right level of education and skills and attainment that can meet the future needs of work um, in Suffolk? Um, we know that the cost of living issue at the moment, which we'll talk about a lot today, has also created um, certain issues too. And we'll also hear about salaries for workers in Suffolk being lower in many cases uh, than the national and even regional average as well. So we know the challenges that we face. And that's really just a prelude to say that that's why it's so important that the board has set workplace health, improving workplace health as a priority. And that's the work that we're doing, we're picking up in the Best Health and Work um, <coughs> Partnership. Um, so our ambition is to support employers in Suffolk to create an environment in which employees can flourish, um, the support to be well at work, um, and also that those who've been hardest hit by the pandemic as well, because we know that certain sectors have been hit harder than others. I'm thinking of tourism, hospitality, production, manufacturing, and other sectors, just to name a few. So we want to target the support where it's needed most as well. So that's why the first component in the work, and the, I'll just briefly set out what we've uh, uh, set out in the paper, is about having a baseline measure. What are the key stresses? What are the things that, that are impacting in workplaces? Where are the areas we need to prioritise our approach? And that's important because we want to be speaking to, as Richard said, all of the sectors across Suffolk. So our voluntary community sector colleagues, our business sectors, um, statutory sectors and other organisations as well, to understand from them what are the key issues. We know a certain amount of this. We're not by any means start, starting from a, 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 a stop stopping point. Uh, but we wanted to understand that to shape the way that we work. And that's why we've suggested a reference group to inform the work of the partnership so we can have those meaningful conversations and focus that work where it's most needed. Um, we're setting up an innovations fund. So we want to make funding available to support those interventions that will make the most difference so that organisations and employers can bid for funding to support some of those things. We think that's crucial, is a crucial element of what we're doing and can make a really, really big um, difference. Uh, we're refreshing our accreditation scheme, workplace accreditation scheme, which we started back in 2019. We know a lot has changed since then, so we've updated and refreshed the standards within the accreditation scheme, which is known as the Healthy Workplace Award. And again, that creates a really important baseline. It can help employers celebrate what they're doing well, as well as identify the gaps and areas for improvement as well. And obviously with that innovations fund, that might then link in with that, because if there are obvious gaps and areas for improvement, there is potential funding in place for that as well. And finally, we want to develop a programme of targeted and effective communication and engagement. 
that tailors those messages. There's no one size fits all. Because as I say, we know that different sectors have been affected differently, especially as we come out of the pandemic as well. So how can we tailor and support them in the best way that we possibly can? So finally, as, as anchor institutions, we've talked about anchor institutions uh, many times in the past. Collectively, those of you on this board represent a significant proportion of the workforce in Suffolk. So in a really, really good place to act as exemplars for supporting workplace health. And that's why one of the recommendations and asks really in the paper is not just to endorse and support the work that we're doing, but to reaffirm the commitment that this board made originally back in 2015 to workplace accreditation and to actually look at going through the Healthy Workplace Award as member organisations as a really good opportunity not just to improve workplace health of your own workforce, but to support one another um, as well. So that's one of the specific asks is to apply for accreditation. There'll be the support available to do that but also to maintain the infrastructure to make sure we can manage that accreditation process effectively, to call on nominations for assessors from the member organisations who will receive free training and will help manage that process as well. And there's even a date we've set out in the paper where there'll be that training available. So there is a really clear role that we think this board can play, certainly as exemplars for good workplace health. So that really is the proposals we've set out, uh, described fairly briefly in the paper. I think it's a combination of those things will make the single biggest difference. And we're really pleased to be working with partners, uh, both on this board, including colleagues in Chamber of Commerce, the Local Enterprise Partnership, and the others that we've mentioned as well. So this really is a, a collective effort. So happy to take any questions um, that you might have. Uh, thank you for listening. Andrew, you want to kick off? Thank you, Mr Chairman. And, and before Richard goes, I'd very much like to put a question to you. It's not a trick question, um, but I'm very glad that this has been set up. Uh, I'd like to know more about it, um, because it's good to see you here, but who else is involved? I know the Chamber's involved, etc. But one thing I'd like specifically to ask the, you know, the, the partnership to give consideration to is the impact of working from home. Uh, you know, I note uh, you know, there have been lots of positive benefits from that for some, many, but not for all, uh, and it can have a deleterious effect. Uh, in my view, uh, on people's, people's work uh, balance, um, uh, both positive and negative, but uh, I'd very much like to hear from the partnership um, what, what they think or what it thinks. So um, your point about working from home, we've, we've almost not spelled it out specifically because it is now so inherent in, in, in what we do. I mean, I, I work for an organisation which is 100% um, hybrid. You know, there is nobody that isn't working partly in the office and partly at home. Um, but, you know, we referred to a lot of things that we've started before that we've now refreshed and updated. So when you look at some of the, the um, plans that we had to get people involved in terms of accreditation and, and um, awards, etc., all of that's being updated to take account of where we are now uh, and what the, the position looks like now. Um, and I think we've got to look at... Um, when we're looking particularly at, at some of the small and medium uh, sized companies, a lot of those companies may well never get to a position where uh, others were in the past, where they were always in the office and they could see people and they could have that interaction. That may never be the case uh, for them, particularly with some of these um, smaller companies. So I think we are absolutely building that into the work that we're looking at. Um, we can spell it out as a specific, but for me, it, it's just how work is today. It, it is not um, something that we should be saying, oh, it's, it's very different and some people will be like this and some people will be like that because the whole position has changed and that's now normal. It's the new normal. Um, yeah, I completely understand that. Um, I think we, I think there, there, are, there are positives and negatives. Absolutely. Uh, and we can get caught up in these things like reduced absence, presenteeism, whatever that is, and uh, turnover, etc. And we've got to be careful to, to, to make sure that we use measures um, that, that are representative of real outcomes rather than just stats. Completely, completely agree. Okay. Uh, Becky. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the um, presentation. I, um, I think a lot of the papers here today are obviously working strategies and they need to reflect the change in um, what we consider normal and reflect the change in life. So I think 
one of the I'd be interesting to see how um, the cost of living crisis comes into the um, the strategy with a uh, good well-being, good work he workplace health, because workplace health equals financial health, and we know well one of the factors, should I say, um, and we know that there's an increase of in-work poverty um, following the cost of living um, crisis and. Um, my colleague um, Bobby Bennett gave a very good story when she was interviewed yesterday over, over the poverty strategy. With you've got nurses that are working full time, very long hours, um, you know, or two, um, have, having two lots of wages coming in, but they're still struggling um, due to the extra financial um, benefits. So I'd be interested to see how we can have a healthy workplace. Um, which reflects and supports those people that may be on that in work poverty sort of situation. That's a, it's certainly a really important point and that will factor into our plans. In fact, I talked about the accreditation scheme briefly before and we've updated that and included a new standard around inclusive employment which will factor in some of the cost of living elements as well. So we did want to make sure that that was still relevant and fit for purpose. And based on really what Richard was saying as well, is we did a lot of work back in 2018 and 2019 on the back of the annual public health report looking at um, working for wellbeing. And a part of that was working with Chamber of Commerce colleagues with around 80 different organisations, focusing on what the different areas they felt would be of greatest concern and benefit around workplace health. And one of the areas that came up from that was about resilience and what resilience meant and what that meant for individual organisations. And it was very much about allowing and enabling them to look at what that meant for them in terms of the definition of that. And of course, what meant for resilient relationships, arrangements, healthy work, what, what was the case then is probably quite different to how that is now. So one element of the work that we're going to be doing is going back to that original cohort of around 80 different um, employers and ask them if some of what we produced then still fit for purpose. And I suspect they'll say, well, it is, but actually we need more and there's, there's, there's work that wasn't the case then because the context has changed. So we definitely want to go back and have those conversations, make sure some of those things are, are factored in, absolutely. Thanks, Ed. Um, thanks, Chris. Obviously, line management is absolutely fundamental to, to workplace health. You know, if you have an inspirational, supportive boss, it's going to be good for your health. If, if you've got a boss that isn't supportive, it's not going to be good. So what sort of emphasis are you going to place or work are you thinking about doing around promoting good line management in Suffolk? Yeah, that, that, that's true. And um, I remember for those of you in the room who might have been there for the launch of our um, resilience work we did back in 2019 at, at Astral Park, Dame Carol Black was one of the keynote speakers there. And that's one of the points she made. She said, you know, you can invest in various different interventions from, you know, gym subsidies to free fruit and all those things are, are really useful. But she described them as sticking plasters if the fundamental points weren't in place. And the one thing she said makes the single biggest difference to well-being at work is, like you say, it is the um, relationship between a line manager and, the, and their report. So that is, that is going to be a big part of the work that we're doing, is both what the support is in place for managers as well, for their own well-being, because that can be overlooked as well, that can support them to be better managers, but also about that fundamental relationship between a manager and their, and their employees. So that is, that is absolutely part of the work that we're doing. Thanks. Wendy. Thank you. Um, Chris, great, great report I, um, and really good work. Uh, I just was interested in the, the employers that aren't good um, and I think it, it's great and aspirational, isn't it, that we, that we help people who are already supporting and help them support people better. But I think we're probably all aware that there are people out there who, some employers who don't pay sick leave, who maybe are pressurising or not allowing people to come back to work after. In, in lots of different ways, and particularly with the, the cost of living crisis, there's a real risk that that will get worse. So my question was, how far will this work identify some of those less favourable practices, and um, what kind of levers do you think we have to, to bring them to the party? I think, I think that's a really good point. I think you're right, there are some less um, enlightened employers that perhaps don't invest the same amount of um, effort in um, workplace wellbeing, and we don't want to work with the same organisations we've already worked with that are already doing that. But there is a certain element to say, you know, there's the pressure that will be placed on by improving workplace health and standards of workplace health, whether that might be the accreditation scheme or some of the other work that we're doing, which we want to see applied to other 
organizations and employers as well. So we do want to make sure we're working with them, we're supporting them, because in many cases they might need that extra support they don't already have. So whether it's our innovations fund where we'll have some clear criteria set out, whether it's the accreditation scheme and potentially those who've been through the scheme can mentor and support others who might need that as well. So we do want to have that mutual support in place. I mean, we're not going to be able to reach and provide that to everyone by, by any means, but that's something we do want to do. So we don't want to work with the same employers that we, we already have worked with, but we think we can use them potentially as case studies to support others, and I think that's important. Robert. Yeah, um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, really interesting and, and, and pleased to see that we are looking to try and improve people's um, lives through work at work. So in that regard, when you're trying to encourage companies to be a, a part of the accredit accreditation, um, two things. First one is um, peer pressure. ISO 1000 and all the other ISO numbers that you get sitting on the bottom of, of uh, letterheads um, telling potential customers that they do the job much better than anybody else that hasn't got an ISO number. Can we make sure that, that we look to do that with this, with the accreditations, that we encourage companies that are accredited to put that information on the bottom of their letterhead so that they can be seen to then put pressure on their, custo their, their, their customers to use them rather than somebody that doesn't use our, our company with accreditations. I think that would be certainly a good way forward of encouraging customers, uh, companies to, to um, join in and, and make, make a difference. And certainly I sit on the board of um, Suffolk Group Holdings, uh, the Vertas and Concertus, et cetera, et cetera. And I know they're very keen on um, their helping their, their employees to be healthier and, and, and better uh, employees on the back of it. So um, if you need to be an introduction to them, which I'm sure you don't, but if you did, then I'd be very happy to do that for you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, great to hear, Chris, you talk about the impact of anchor institutions and the different sector aspects. Um, my question's more about SMEs, though, which make up the bulk of, of Suffolk. And, and so what, how are you working or planning on working to engage with those SMEs? And then linked to that, of course, many of them are still trying to cope and recover from the pandemic. This is another thing that burdens them potentially, albeit we can sit here and see all the value of it. It's another thing, so how's that being tackled? And linked to that, apologies, kind of three questions in one. Linked to that, does this work go as far as supporting those bosses? Because I can see for them in particular in their mental health, they need to be able to, they need to be in a good place for them to be able to support their employees as well. Yeah, thank you. So yes, you're quite right. SMEs account for the majority of workforce in, in Suffolk. So they're absolutely a group that we really want to work with and are, are already working with as well. So we've cultivated some really good relationships in the work we've done previously, um, in the work we've done over the course of COVID-19, the relationships we've built up with them, and they're absolutely going to be factored in. So they'll, you know, we're looking at membership of the, the core partnership, but also the reference group I mentioned as well, which is the far broader set of, of organisations and employers, which will absolutely feature um, SMEs. We'll be encouraging them to uh, access the support we're providing, which might be through the targeted programme of engagement and communication I mentioned. It could be through the accreditation scheme and will absolutely be through the innovations fund um, as well. And you're quite right, there are going to be some bosses that aren't in, managers aren't in the right place to do that at the moment. So we do want to work across the other main public mental health programme as well. So, you know, using the emotional needs um, audit that Suffolk Mind provided to look at the well-being of different organisations as part of that measurement. So where we can see that there are issues and they might need some support, we can target it more effectively um, that way. Okay, that's everyone that wanted to speak. So, um, in terms of the recommendations, I think uh, pretty much everyone's in support. I haven't heard anyone sort of any dissent, so I, I think we can take that as generally agreed. Is, is that uh, am I getting around the room? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that report. Um, and we look forward to um, hearing how we're doing, heading towards that accreditation, how we're wide, doing widely. Okay, what I propose now is that we take a quick 10-minute break. Uh, so we'll start by these clocks at 11.10. I appreciate these clocks aren't the same as everyone's watches, so, uh, but we'll go by these clocks. So we'll start in 10 minutes, come back in 10 minutes' time.
Okay, folks, we're going to make a, make a start, please. So, the next item uh, for us today is uh, agenda item uh, eight, um, which is reimagining healthy behaviours, community conversations and next steps. I'm pleased to welcome Linda Bradford, who's Head of Health and Improvement, um, to take us through the presentation. Thanks, Linda. I'd like to do so. Good morning, everybody. Uh, could somebody put the slide set up for me? Thank you. So, um, reimagining healthy health behaviours, I'm going to quickly um, remind people what this is about. We did come uh, last year to uh, introduce the topic area. Uh, and I'm going to extend more. And this is going to be a piece uh, reflecting back on what comments were made about voice, is, is about how we're doing community um, co-production uh, and what that looks like and what communities are telling us. And then I've got a couple of things that I would last, like to ask of, of members of the board. So um, just a quick reminder here, when I'm talking about healthy behaviours, I'm particularly interested in those behaviours which create the, the poorest outcomes for people's lives, the poorest quality of life. So I'm talking about smoking, uh, inactivity, um, eating uh, badly, uh, being overweight, uh, and also um, the amount of alcohol that people consume. Uh, and this is a, a summary of some things that we need to take into account. So we invest money in public health into services that help people do those behaviours which are really good for your health. Uh, but we still recognise that large numbers of people still smoke. Uh, we have over 400,000 people in the county who are, 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 have a weight that is over uh, of the recommended guidelines and will have an impact on their lives over time. Uh, three, over 300 people a year die from alcohol-related diseases. Uh, children um, and young people are not as active as they could be, so there's a lot of work still to be done. And um, the contract we have that supports uh, individuals to, to modify their behaviour is coming to its end. The world has changed. We've had COVID. We have new structural um, organisations. So it was an opportunity to start conversations with people to see how we could do things differently. And because health inequalities is a big part of health and health of public health and a commitment of my own, um, we started with communities. So we spoke to communities and I will give you a bit more information about that. But as just a quick reminder about this procurement that we will end up um, coming to an end in October 23, has four different elements to it and they're all running concurrently. So we're looking at how we do co-production to get really good information and understand that, uh, what people need to change. We use data, which is our needs assessment. I'm working with stakeholders, and there's a range of individuals involved, including uh, people that are in this room and uh, representatives from their organisations. And also that procurement process, which is the sort of contracting element of it. So before we started, we were very clear that we wanted to use a range of, of, of opportunities to have conversations with people. Uh, and that's including communities of interest, but also localities of interest. Uh, so we are working uh, regularly uh, with three individuals from Health Watch who are uh, community ambassadors and they come to a weekly meeting with us and they follow the programme of work all of the time uh, such that uh, the language we use is much better than perhaps it would be. We try to move away from terms, which I know what I'm talking about but other people don't know anything about. You know, we've got to be, you know, public health has a habit of using posh words and lots of people switch off. Um, using conventional materials, uh, uh, ways of working like surveys, uh, focus groups, but having focus groups in a slightly different design than perhaps we've done before, looking at case studies and stories, uh, and the paper I presented has five case studies that we've collected, which I think are worth a read if you've got time. Uh, looking at how we work with the assets, again, that have been described that are in communities already, in order that we create service designs that are meaningful for people. And then when we do come to that procurement place, we have people as part of our panel on the evaluation that have lived experience, and we ensure that our equalities you know, impact assessment is making sure that we don't increase inequalities, but we reduce them. So that's the way we're going to do it. Um, and I wanted to just show you some provisional information that's coming back. So we sent out a survey through our conventional routes, but we also this time used Facebook. And um, we have an admin group of about 86 
uh, admin groups in Suffolk that we work with closely with Chris and some other colleagues. And um, through that route and others, we got um, 636 people fully completed a survey, which is really high. It's the highest number we've had for any public health survey of this type that we've done before. But what we did find is the majority of those people were, were over 46 years of age uh, and not uh, so many people that were of the younger age. So we're going to use different methods to, to, to contact those. Uh, so those uh, in that 19 to 45, under 46, was a much lower representation. But we've got some really good um, input from people that are over 46. And most services to support behaviour change, like stop smoking, tend to be people 50 and over anyway. So what we have found, though, is that most of those people are, are white British. So we've got to do something a bit harder to find those communities that are not represented in the survey. Uh, the other point to note is that those people that did respond, 49.5% of them had a health problem already. So we've got some really good understanding out about people who have a disability or long-term conditions, but we've got to find out about other people who perhaps are underrepresented. So I won't go through all of the slides, but you can look at those that will come out afterwards. But so far, out of those surveys, there are three things that are coming up. Uh, that are about motivation. So people are interested in seeking support from a conventional service when they have illness or poor health. So if something's happened to them that gives them a bit of a scare, that's a bit of a jolt to maybe want to, to change your behaviour. Uh, the item of particular interest was weight loss. More people wanted to know about how to lose weight than anything else. And there was a big issue about access. How do I get services at a time that's convenient for me? And, and that's particularly of, of a concern for people in rural areas. Uh, and we looked at barriers. So we have to be really careful that the language we use doesn't put people off. That, that what we're offering people is, is affordable. So we don't want to be setting up face-to-face uh, -face activities where people have to go somewhere that's a long way away from home. They have to pay for transport and perhaps childcare. Uh, we need to be thinking about how those, uh, that provision is comfortable for that person. So, so for some uh, individuals uh, that have a particular um, condition like diabetes, they might not want to be with a group of people who are healthy apart from uh, um, being overweight. So we have to think about making individuals feel comfortable so that they're not uncomfortable in the environments we create. Um, we need to make it convenient and uh, we need to make people aware about where services, because lots of people said they didn't know where the services were uh, and how they could get to them. So these are some things, and, and a lot of people recognize these, uh, but I think COVID slightly changed the, the tone around that. Um, so in order to increase engagement, so people are more active and more want wanting to, to come to provision that supports them, and we know that when people come to a service, the outcomes are really good, but we have a large number of people that don't even want to come, and when they do come, they drop out after one or two weeks. So what is important is, is that the, whatever we provide, if it's fun, people are more likely to engage. Uh, if we support people with the cost of what that might mean for them in time as well as money, uh, if we give them really good quality information about behaviour change and why it's meaningful to them, um, we help them with setting targets and goals that are reasonable and, and achievable, and that they have other people that they can do it with. These are really important things that we need to be thinking about for the future. Uh, and, and this slide's very busy, uh, and people can look at that outside, but what came out of this is that we need to have a, a, a range, a lot of choice. Lots of people want to have contact in different ways. So um, emails, uh, telephone, texting, face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, digital online um, uh, information are, are, are ways that people perhaps engage in a lot more after COVID than they did before and less on face-to-face. -face. But they want smaller groups if they are going to do face-to-face -face and regular touch points. So the next slide is really a summary of, of some of the case studies uh, um, that are in the paper. But it's these are key drivers. So we need to be looking at and understanding what the motivations for changing people's behaviours are and build resource to support that and, and respond to it. We need to understand attitudes and culture of different groups, so different people feel differently about different um, healthy behaviours. We need to understand um, the impact of particular uh, life events um, and uh, community relationship-based support, so working with other individuals that have 
um, day-to-day or weekly contact with individuals, not driving people into a service where they meet somebody that perhaps that they've never met before. Uh, how we advertise and, and use media to promote what's available uh, and, and where um, and, and the impact of the environment and, and people's lives which prevent them to, from changing. So um, there's a survey that's gone out. I'll send that out to everybody and I really would like everybody to promote this for children, young people and parents. We've got very low uptake. Although we've got a large uptake for adults, we haven't got so much from families and children and young people. So I'll send that out separately. Uh, this is the timeline of where we're going with our procurement. Uh, but the bit I really want to ask is, is how can this wealth of data, and I've really made this very reductive, there's a whole heap of data here. So a lot of people here look at self-care and helping people to help themselves uh, and be, um, you know, have a better quality of life. How can I get the data that I've got to you to help you design your services, but also to understand how perhaps you can communicate with uh, people. So that's one ask, is how do I use the data I've got to inform prevention activities that other people, apart from public health, are investing in? Uh, and then the second piece, which is quite urgent, is, is there are opportunities here to bring our assets together and provide different types of services. So particularly around weight management, around tobacco control, perhaps interventions around physical activity. How can partners here work with public health to bring some resources together so that if we do want to commission something, for instance, like a, an integrated um, weight management service, who could work with me, uh, and, and I am working with some individuals already, but I, I value the opportunity to talk to other organisations who can help us to think about how we might use our resources collectively. Um, some examples of new ways of working might be that rather than having 12-week um, programmes of work, we could have some micro-budgets or personal budgets, so people working in, in social prescribing or VCS um, organization, sector organisations can maybe have a small budget. So if you're working with somebody who wants to be more active but they can't afford a pair of trainers, there's a mechanism that they can be supported to get that. Maybe how they could um, have a small amount of money to get a, an allotment or, or, or various other um, activities. So we're very open um, to not locking it all into services in the way we have currently. So that's it really. Any questions? Thanks very much. Uh, Becky, this first off. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you, Linda, for the presentation. Um, can I ask something around what um, we consider as a truly representative figure with regards to um, our population? I mean, I think Suffolk latest population figures is seven hundred and sixty-one thousand, yeah. or around, around about that. And um, whilst I appreciate the You've, got, you've had some good returns for your surveys, and I also appreciate there's different subgroups that we look at as opposed to the population mm -hmm. as a whole. What, <coughs> what figure do we actually use when we say this is a really true representation of um, Suffolk population? And then moving on to engagement and how we engage. <coughs> and um, I was struck the other day, and I thought, I thought I'm quite a trendy mum, but obviously I'm not. But, um, because my son said to me, Mum, you're still on Facebook. Who uses Facebook these days? So I, I, it's important that we, um, if you want to engage with those younger, uh, uh, younger generations, and I appreciate I'm getting into the older generations now, perhaps, um, uh, things like TikTok, dare I say, TikTok and things like that are the yeah. platforms that the younger people are using. And Facebook is very much um, sort of my generation and older and old now, which tells by your, your returns. Mm -hmm. um, but also engaging families, and it needs, and the engagement almost needs to be like a. Um, if I think about mother and baby, mother and parent groups, or it almost needs to be a coffee um, conversation. It's a conversation that starts over a cup of coffee, and someone will say, "Have you filled in this survey?" There's some really interesting things about that, and then they encourage each other to. It's almost almost doing it by stealth rather than. Um, sending out a survey and they say, oh, not enough, enough, another survey yeah, that we need to... Yeah, our survey is one way, so that's yeah. why I really need Yeah, that's need what I mean, there's different, yeah. different ways of almost doing engagement by stealth rather than, yeah, just, um, yeah, ordin the ordinary, ordinary ways we normally do it. So 
So, so I think the ordinary ways, I'll, I'll take quite a few of those. So, so uh, with regard to working out what's representative, so we have a look at the sample. Does the sample give the range of, of age groups? Does it give the range of profiles? So that survey uh, has a, a reasonable range and it is representative, although I didn't show it here, of our, our localities. So we did have a representation that sort of mirrored the populations of those areas. But we recognise its limitations because it's not picking up the younger communities. The reason we use Facebook is, is Facebook administrators are really good at activating communities because they tend to be of a certain age. So they often use other routes. So some of those Facebook groups use Instagram uh, and other social media. So they're just a, a portal really. So, that, so we do recognise that it has that limitation. But I really need some help with how we get to those younger communities. So we've used our existing relationships with uh, schools, um, children, young people services, uh, not to 19, etc. But there's other ways. And, and so any comments or suggestions I would really greatly receive. The value of the survey is, is that we get people's voice, what they say, because when you interview somebody and you write down what they say, you still interpret it. And the thing I like about surveys is people write those things in their own words. And that's important that we hear the tone of how people say things, because that tells us something about the, the feelings behind some of the things. So surveys is not the only way. So yes, any help with that, I'd be really grateful for. So it's not perfect. We try as much as, much as possible. We are going out. We are having stakeholder events, uh, and uh, our stakeholder events have been very broad, but the next group of stakeholder events will be topic specific, and we will go physically to a space and be bringing some people with lived experience in. So again, I'll be asking people for help to bring that in, because we're at the point soon where we're going to have to start thinking about what our service design looks like. You know, we, what are we going to buy? Are we going to buy a load of cookery courses? Do we want to have uh, lots of people that are working with individuals to go and walk around a shop to learn how to read packets? I don't know. That, yeah, we're we're very we're at the beginning, but there's lots of. It's not going to be what we've got now, which is an integrated service that you go to for 12 weeks to have an intervention. It's going to be something very different. Thank you. And Mark. Thank you, and um, it's a real challenge <laughs> having been involved in this um, for, you know, on a professional basis for, for many decades. Um, be behavior change is a real, mm -hmm. real issue. Um, we also know that if we take a universal approach, we risk taking inequalities, yeah. raising them further. Um, so that whilst welcome a survey of approach how are we going to reach those who are unlikely to participate in the survey which could then potentially give us a design problem uh, from the start um, and we know that those who have the worst outcomes are those who have learning disability those who have severe and enduring mental illness and those who lived in deprived populations and unless we um, do you have a targeted approach to hearing from them and understanding their responses and what would help to influence? Uh, I think we would face an issue. And even where we have a best evidenced intervention, and I think about Desmond from a diabetes perspective, or the um, you know the diabetes prevention program, we congratulate ourselves when we get figures of 10% of people with that condition participating. Yeah. Um, and that's the level of the challenge that, 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 that we do face here. Um, so I uh, appreciate the, the extent of the problem. I think, again, this is another issue of us having to consider differential approaches um, and uh, the the co-production approach is so vital, I think, in this, um, if we're going to make a, a difference for those who, who really do need the most help.
So I agree completely. So we're hoping that our case studies, so we're working with, with a group of uh, voluntary sector organisations that have that nuanced understanding of communities that we've got about only eight because we started it about three weeks ago. But they're really important because they tell you a lot of the themes that are coming through uh, and we're selecting those case studies by going to, to where we think people that aren't represented are there. Uh, what is different? Although we did do a survey, we've got 300 people out of that, 536 people who want to be engaged with this piece of work going forward. I've never had that many people that want to participate. So I, I think um, COVID potentially has changed the, the use of online. We've got a, we're going to have a portal where information is put and we're going to drive people there, but we've got to go and find people and that's the bit that I want help with, is, is people have got any ideas and at the moment my community of concern are children and young people and their parents, so that's what I really need help with at the moment is how we get to those individuals because the survey response is really low and when we go to partnership meetings it's often the same people at those meetings and we want people that are not represented at the moment, but thank you for your comments. Thanks, I've got Wendy next. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Linda. It's just a couple of points that I don't know if will help and, and just a, a question, really. Um, one was about some of the work we've done already around digital inclusion at HealthWatch, which has been really helpful. Yeah. And I was thinking about the conversation about new normal. Um, and I think people are often in a really different space than we think they are. But they were very clear about the barriers and the things that we could change that would make it easier for them to participate, which might be useful. And the other thing is um, uh, My Health, Our Future work, which I think is, you know, it's got such a longevity to it now and is really picking up those groups that we really need to be concerned about going to Mark's point about perhaps so that that's a helpful thing. The other thing was thinking about how we cite this work more generally and some of the other work that we've talked about today. I'm just really aware with all the cost of living crisis that we'll be talking about later that this can feel like the icing on the cake, can't it? It can feel like, you know, maybe if we can all be a bit, we can be well or, or some people are just going to fall off the edge. Maybe we need to think about this is how we are going to get through this crisis. Yes. Um, and that could be the message from the board that we're only going to get through this together if we make sure that everybody is as well as possible. Um, and that follows quite beautifully from the COVID crisis, doesn't it? Where we understood that we were only well when we were all well. Um, so maybe that kind of messaging might help. Thank you. Carol. Thank you. Um, I welcome um, the idea of um, some funding going to the VCSE to help support with purchasing sports equipment. I think that would be really useful. Um, and with regards to accessing the 12 to 18 year olds for the survey, um, I think potentially we could target the VCSE organisations that work with youth, youth organisations. And as a girl guider myself, I'm thinking about girl guiding and scouting. Um, because you've got you've got the children there, so I'm happy to work with you. On Thank that. you. And, and if you're holding an event where you have children, young people present, we'd be really keen to attend, because um, there is a feeling that uh, children, young people, and parents are surveyed out. So it's how we bring it to them in an interesting way. Martin, you want to come in? Yeah. Thank you. I just want to pick up on. Uh, Becky's point earlier around the, the engagement and the, the scale, um, and with Anna in the room, I'm not going to try and tell you what a, a proportion of the population that is representative is going to be, um, but um, we heard earlier from um, when, when Sarah spoke uh, about the size of the engagement um, within the Suffolk Needs Met survey and the sort of population size that we need to, um, to engage in that to give a representative sample. So that's maybe an indication. Um, I'm not suggesting at one moment that we can do that for this piece of work, um, but there may be some elements of that conversation that we can have. Linda spoke earlier, one of her slides uh, talked about addressing the wider determinants of health and, and refocusing some of this work into the more prevention side, recognising that we can't commission services that are going to buy our way out of this problem. Uh, we can't put 400,000 people on a weight management course, um, but what we can do is start to address those um, uh, those determinants of excess weight um, and some of the prevention uh, aspects that we can bring into that. So um, you know, we'll, we'll talk with Sarah, we'll talk with John about how some of the information that comes out of that could be used to try and inform some of this work as well. Thanks. Uh, Arthur. Thanks, Matthew. 
couple of questions, I suppose. Um, the first is, I'm not clear what the outcome, and this sounds like a daft thing to say, I'm not clear what success looks like. So if I pick on stop smoking, I guess you're not saying nobody smokes in Suffolk. I mean, clearly that would be very successful, but I guess that's not what you're saying. I, mean, I think that's really important in terms of what are we actually trying to achieve, because mm -hmm. that determines what we commission uh, as a result. And at the moment, there's a, there's a gap for me there. You know, the other observation, I, I understand the point about surveying and the importance of it, but I kind of hope, and maybe it is a hope, and people tell me I'm deluded, that there's international research around this as to what works, um, because Suffolk folk aren't that different from, let's no. say, Essex folk or Norfolk folk, let alone anywhere else. Um, and we're not logical as human beings. Mm -hmm. So if you ask me what I think would work, I'd be lying to myself. That's why people make New Year's resolutions. Um, so I just think there's a, a absolutely engage, but up to a point, that isn't going to give us the answer, I suppose, isn't no, it? No, and, not an and, I, and I haven't given all of the methodology that we've used, because that's a huge piece of work. So, so you know, people, we're talking to, to community first, because it's really important that we hear where they're at now in COVID. Some of what they're telling me, I've heard it before for a long time, and, and the evidence says that. We're also talking at stakeholders, what's it like working with people in Suffolk right now? We're looking at our data, uh, uh, and then we're going to have to test out what that might look like. But what, one of the things I know about behaviour change is the 12-week programme is too short. My life is full of lots of different things, and, and for mo most people here that have been working from home, you've probably been less active, eaten more. But you've got to um, understand where people are at now is the starting point. But that other data then supports whether what they're telling you is true, because they'll say, yes, this, and you go, yeah, but the data's saying this. So, so I think it's all of those things are triangulated together. But the most important bit, and this is where co-production is key here, is we've got to reflect it back. This is what all of these data things are telling me. This is what I think we could do differently. Is that correct for you? So for somebody who's clinically uh, obese, having a 12-week program over three, you know, a three-month intervention with a follow-up six months later is no good. But if I had a 15-point um, um, activities that they could dip into, <coughs> right now what I need is to know how to shop well. So I'll go and have two or three conversations with somebody, do a supermarket visit. Uh, that settles. If somebody contacts me in six weeks' time, I might actually want to know how I can cook so I could go somewhere. So it's having bigger range of products that are pick and mix and, and we can work with voluntary sector organisations and statutory sector organisations to help people modify those behaviours in a small step by step, whereas what we've tried to do is do a lot of change in a really short period of time and people don't buy that. Okay, thank you for that. So, in terms of recommendations, um, obviously we've been asked to consider, that's the easy bit, but in terms of which organisations would be interested in co-commissioning for health behaviours, have you had enough information or I think... It's really if anybody wants to contact me afterwards. So, yeah. so uh, you know, I, I am already speaking to colleagues in the CCG. I'm speaking to colleagues in, in um, hospital services that are doing tobacco dependence. So we're looking at those opportunities. But I'm particularly interested in districts and boroughs if there's anything around that, that physical activity space that, that we could, to, could work with colleagues. So uh, anybody wants to, you know, just send me an email and we'll, we'll try and check in on what that might look like. So, Arthur, if you can filter that through your network as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much thank for that, Linda. Okay. Um, the next item uh, that we've got before us today is implementing the National Drug Strategy in Suffolk. Um, and I'd like to welcome Sharon Jarrett, Head of Health Improvement, and Alison Amstelz, uh, Senior Health Improvement Commissioner. Um, over to you. Thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. I think we're still in the morning. Um, my name is Sharon Jarrett. I think you might remember me from last time. Um, head of um, Children, Young People and Families and Misbehaviours within Health Improvement in Suffolk Public Health and Communities. What a title. And my colleague here, Alison Amstutz, is our Lead Commissioner for Drug and Alcohol and Sexual Health Services. So um, I'm going to keep this five-minute blurb um, on the focus of the questions that were in the paper and the ask of the board. Um, but clearly on the questions following that, you might want to dig down a little bit more into the detail of the strategy. Um, you might hear reference to alcohol 
in what I'm saying and what we talk about during this agenda item. Although it is a drug strategy, we have clear support from government, from the Office of Health Improvement and Disparities, which you will hear called OHID for short, that we can bring alcohol into the local implementation of the national drug strategy because it is so often a co-occurring condition to get alongside drugs, the two go hand in hand. And in fact, in Suffolk and in many other areas, we have integrated drug and alcohol services because of that. So don't think we've gone off track. You'll often hear me use the term we. When I use the term we, I'm talking about Suffolk Public Health and Communities, predominantly Alison, myself, and the core team, uh, working with all our partners to do the work that we have done to date around implementing locally the national drug strategy. So could you just bear that in mind? Because it's quicker than saying public health and communities every time. Okay. So just a swift context, if you like. Substance misuse then, drugs and alcohol misuse, is both a cause of health and social inequality and poorer life outcomes and also a result of health inequalities, social inequalities and poor life outcomes, i.e. we have a bit of a chicken and egg, don't we, but the two uh, reinforce the other. And we have heard many times about the cost of living increases and all of the deprivation, all of the... Um, things that the, our population in Suffolk and indeed our service providers have had to deal with over the past few years, which uh, actually has an impact on the use of substances within Suffolk, and we know that the complexity of presentation is getting worse. So this national drug strategy that was uh, published in December, and as a result of the Dame Carol Black report of 2021 around July, the findings in that, stark findings in that, and the recommendations in that, um, is an important opportunity for us in Suffolk to actually start to make a difference for those people's lives who are impacted by the use of drugs or indeed the use of alcohol, where it causes harm on both themselves and those that they are, their loved ones, their families and the communities around them. It comes with increased financial investment in drug and alcohol treatment, support and recovery provision across all sectors of healthcare and communities. It is government funded, but it is a mandated 10 year strategy. And by that, I mean that whilst we have significant additional funding that is um, recognising the different levels of inequality and prevalence across the country, so the way the funding comes down to each individual local authority area takes account of that, but it comes with a very, I would call it stringent, menu of interventions that we have to be delivering very um, clearly stated targets and ambitions that we will be working towards to meet. But it does also state that we have local flexibility so that we use our own understanding of what the need is in Suffolk that we need to improve, where the gaps are, where the service provision isn't working well, where our partnership and accountability isn't working well, so that we focus in on what is actually going to make the best difference for Suffolk residents. So we do have responsibility to all of our stakeholders, service providers, most importantly our residents of Suffolk and those that are impacted by drug use or alcohol use, but we have a clear accountable responsibility to OHID and the government. So just to very briefly, the strategy on a page, which was on page 100 in your pack, sets out three clear ambitions, the big areas of work, breaking drug supply chains, delivering a world-class treatment and recovery system and reducing the demand for recreational drugs. And all of that is absolutely underpinned by <coughs> an emphasis on partnerships and accountability. And that middle one about delivering that world-class treatment and recovery system is underpinned by getting more people engaging with support and treatment in order to get them into recovery and abstinence so that they are overcoming that drug problem or associated alcohol problem. So Alison and I use the term, it's about partnership, accountability, a partnership approach, it's about integration, alignment and collaboration. And since the announcement of the drug strategy and the uh, responsibility we have as a local authority, a whole heap of work has gone on, which has been described in the paper about engagement with stakeholders, providers, service users, public communities, 
our system leaders, our system partnership forums about where we need to put the focus. And that has been um, informed as well by a health needs assessment for drug and alcohol, picking out on met need, um, and also a drug market profile so that we understand what is driving our market around drug provision, uh, the criminal aspects of drug provision. Okay. The findings from that extensive engagement has informed the outline and in fact more detailed plan that we will be submitting um, on Monday to OHID and on the basis of that submission we then get the funding. It is an iterative process, it's not a one-off, it has milestones, it has targets, it has a financial breakdown attached to it, um, but we are in constant conversation with our regional leads to make sure that we flex, develop it on an ongoing way through what is initially the three-year time frame to make sure that we are evaluating as we go so that where we set our ambitions and our targets, are they being reached, are our outcomes being reached, what do we need to do differently, and always checking back through that co-production process and that partnership accountability approach. I will point out, however, that the funding that you will have seen in the paper for this first year, 22-23, is specifically badged, what public health will receive, is specifically badged for enhancing treatment capacity and quality. So there is a big em emphasis coming from the centre at the moment to redress years of underinvestment in our treatment services in order to increase their capacity. And when we think that the recommended workload, caseload for an individual recovery worker is 30, according to Dame Carol Black, and our recovery workers are currently carrying between 60 and 80 on their caseloads, you can see we've got some work to do. So my, my emphasis though this morning is about that partnership approach and that partnership accountability. We have a number of current governance structures, but in our engagement with system leaders, we have heard over and over again that they do not want to set up another partnership board. Although in the gu guidance from the government it says set up a partnership board, <laughs> we were being told we've got enough partnership boards in Suffolk. So we've taken that fully on board um, and we have gone back and we've had that conversation and they have said yes, we understand that. So we have been round several, the um, Suffolk Public Sector Leaders, the Collaborative Communities Board, um, boards and partnerships within the integrated care systems, the alliances, the place based structures, on and on. Um, and beginning to synthesise that actually, if I call it the engine room, we have a group of people within public health and communities and some of our other partners who sit on all of those other governance boards. And that engine room of people, if you like, take the responsibility for making sure that they report, influence, hear from and bring back to the development of the actions and the strategy then we do not necessarily need a partnership board that sits once a month, once a quarter. The other thing about all of those governance structures that are already in place is they don't cover the full remit of all the ambitions that we need to implement and achieve what we're setting out to do for this drug strategy in Suffolk. And some of them do not even cover Suffolk as a whole. So we have a difference, don't we, around our ICS organisations that we have Norfolk and Waveney, and then we have Suffolk and North East Essex. So we begin to get mismatches. So we are also looking, having said that, we will work very much in collaboration with existing governance structures, um, using the people with the knowledge and the expertise and our going and making sure that we are having robust engagement and communication. May I say that includes our voluntary sector partners, it includes our co-production partners, because we must hear from the voice of the people in Suffolk and service users. But still ultimately, we do need to demonstrate that we have an accountable body that we are reporting to that is Suffolk-wide and somehow covers all of the elements of the work that we are trying to do. And when we thought about it with our system leaders and many others, it's the Health and Wellbeing Board that seems to fit that. In that, the representation, the commitment, the knowledge of your service areas, of yourselves in the room, and what you can bring and the challenge that you can bring. But even more than that, the support, the influence, 
and helping us when we might have issues that arise that need unblocking within the system that you can do with that with a Suffolk wide perspective, a health and well-being board perspective and understanding how all of the work that comes together meets to meet the needs of this very vulnerable sector of our population. It does seem to us that the health and wellbeing board is that structure. So all of those other governance boards have a role to play, not negating that at all, and we would be in constant communication with them. And in order to facilitate that, it is also recognised by OHID that within our structures we have additional commissioning support coordination function in order to help us do all of that partnership working. Okay. The other thing then um, just to emphasize I think around that before I come and just ask you for your questions um, and about the ask is that um, we will have as I've said, targets, milestones, outcome indicators. We already have a very robust system in Suffolk for both our drug and alcohol service delivery and outcomes, our criminal justice service delivery, if I think of the Safer Suffolk Partner Community Partnership Board, around their outcomes, their indicators, their monitoring, and around some of our wider community-based monitoring of what's happening in relation to community infrastructure, vulnerability, deprivation, etc. Um, and all of that then becomes the dashboard that we will be working to and that OHID will present to us in order to demonstrate our progress against our ambitions and the things we want to achieve. Um, and we will have to report on a quarterly basis very robustly to OHID. So the governance is very, very high level there, but also it will come through to this board as well as those other governance structures so that we will have very timely ongoing monitoring um, and the ability to flex where we see that we might need to in order to achieve improved outcomes and reduction in the health inequalities, social inequalities experienced by this cohort of our population. I think I'm going to actually stop there because my key ask from yourselves was would you be prepared, please, to take that role as a health and wellbeing board of our top level accountable body? And then if you are in agreement to that, perhaps you could give us some steer about the level of reporting. And also that if you want to come back because you would like more detail <laughs> on the whole of the drug strategy, we're more than happy to do that. But I didn't want to focus on that this morning because actually it's really important for us right now to get this governance sorted out whilst we're doing all of the engagement that we're currently doing. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank, yeah. Thanks very much, Dash Hans. Okay, so we'll go straight to Andrew, who's going to kick us off. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you, Sharon, for that. This is an incredibly important piece of work. Um, and I'd like to amplify, if I may, what you have said about partnership working, because this will not work unless you have full commitment and cooperation of everyone in this room and every organisation represented here. So I fully endorse that the Health and Wellbeing Board uh, would be the right body uh, to oversee this. Um, and I look forward to everyone's um, commitment to this work. Thank you. Thanks so much, Harry. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got one sort of just brief comment first and then sort of an answer to each of the questions that you've posed of us and that are in the papers. Um, but just to briefly say that Obviously, I know this is a sort of a national strategy and that it's, it's something we're obliged to, to implement, but I think it's, just to reiterate, Sharon, what you said, that it's really significant that we've decided to include alcohol in this as well, because I think it would be fundamentally a mistake to just look at drug use on its own, but rather looking at substance misuse in the whole, which I think is going to make things like recovery and treatment so much more effective. Um, so then that's just sort of one reflection I had as I was listening to, to your introduction. In terms of the, the questions you've posed of us, I think... Um, I absolutely agree there are plenty of partnership boards and, and various different organisations uh, that cover sort of the whole spectrum of organisations across the county, which is no bad thing, I have to say. It you know, shows that we are doing, a, I think, a good, work, good job of working in partnership on the whole. But I do think the Health and Wellbeing Board is, is probably the right place for this to come, um, just because, if, as you've said, you've got a range of, of different quite key partners in, in the room, whether it's the, the criminal element when it comes to disrupting um, supply chains, whether it's the <coughs> deprivation and economic and employment opportunities that are going to be part of this solution, or indeed the need for safe and secure housing. Um, so I think this is, in terms of governance, probably the right place for this to come. 
the bit that I'm sort of not so sure about is um, the sort of the frequency and the format of the reporting. And I think that's perhaps something which I'm just going to leave as a rhetorical sort of question, which is that, you know, given the quantity of papers that we've got for this meeting, as I think has already been mentioned, um, it's probably sensible, I think, for maybe those sorts of discussions to take place outside of the meeting, just so that it can be given a bit more thought and a bit more consideration as to how best to, to kind of deal with with both this and all of the other bits of work that's going on at the moment, because I'm what I'm conscious of is that we don't have that many meetings in a year, and I think we're potentially at risk of all of our meetings just being progress updates on the various bits of work that we've commissioned. Um, so that's that's not sort of a that's not very helpful answer to your question, but I think it's it's something that probably needs more thought and consideration than we can get in the time that we've got left. I think. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Tim. Uh, thanks, Matthew, and thanks for the report, Sharon. Uh, this is a really serious issue. Every public meeting we've had online, I've, ever since I've been in this position, it's got worse and worse and worse, and it isn't just about the big urban areas, as you all know, it's out in rural areas, particularly in market towns, and we've got to do something. So I welcome this government initiative with a large dollop of cash, because it's all very well to talk about it without the pound notes, of course, as I always say. Um, I am not well unusually i suppose i'm a bit sitting on the fence and that is unusual um i'm not convinced that the health and well-being board is necessarily the right place when you've got the safer stronger communities board because if we're going to make this really work we will need that well this is a personal view others may differ um we need the evidence to monitor the progress um we put a huge amount of police resources into enforcement we need to keep on with really really strong police enforcement to act as a deterrent, but there's obviously the demand reduction, which will never be done, as I think it was Andrew said, just through police enforcement. It has to be a partnership between everybody here. In fact, all of us as individuals have got a responsibility with that. It's well known also with alcohol and drugs, with domestic abuse, domestic violence, serious sexual offences, which is mentioned in there. So it's how are we going to monitor this? If we only have a quarterly meeting, I'm not sure that's quite going to do the trick for me personally we need to keep on top of it i'm not saying you need to arrange extra meetings we all have far too many meetings to whiz around to um neither do we want to duplicate the effort where we repeat what's happened here at safer stronger community board so i just need to understand how that's going to be clear and if we're going to hold have a governance role that includes holding to account to make sure other agencies whoever it happens to be are actually delivering and how we're going to measure that and i know it's early days but that that's really really important um, so I've got an open mind about that rather than sitting on the fence. The other thing that I don't think is mentioned there, which is important, and that's the issue about road safety, and that's not just about driving cars or motorbikes or lorries as pedestrians and everything else. There is increasing evidence. We are getting more and more drug driving offences, and if you look at places which, in my view, misguidedly have liberalised some of the illegal drug takings, particularly some evidence from the US, there are an increasing number of severe serious accidents, fatal accidents um, with road users um, because people are driving under the influence. So that's another uh, nuance, I suppose, but road safety is a very important part of this. So there needs to be publicity. I welcome the part about demand reduction, education, prevention. We've got to have that coupled with um, tough enforcement, and as far as I'm concerned, that will continue. Um, but also the rehabilitation. I'm not an expert in this. All I would say is this. How do you define, where do you get to the stage where somebody is completely cleaned up so they don't relapse back into the old habit? Now, that's easy to sit here and pontificate, but that's a bit of a concern for me. You do find people get cleaned up for a while, and there's all other parts that go in there. They get housed in multiple occupancy, which I think is a disaster. Um, so there's all sorts of complications there, which is not for discussion now, but we would need to bring that in to make sure that we can work together and be... Uh, very successful. So I'm right behind this. I just need to be absolutely sure we're clear and we've got the right levers to pull and improvement based on evidence and data. So we can say to the public, this money is being well spent and these are the results. And obviously, health and everything it all, all comes into it. Yep. So sorry to ramble on, but I'm <laughs> very, very interested in this. I can Indeed. tell you. <laughs>
I knew you would have a comment in, um, and it's really pertinent. So I won't go into the discussion points, but just to give you an element of reassurance, I hope, then, about the Safer Suffolk Communities Board and all the work that goes through around the criminal exploitation, the criminal justice pathways. So we have had many discussions about this, because that initially that was one of our thoughts, that we would go there. And then it was, but we also have a whole tranche of activity around the treatment. So that includes primary care, acute hospitals, the substance misuse providers. Um, and we might have health representation on Safer Suffolk Communities Board, but is it at the level that we need it? Probably not. So then we were thinking, okay, we go two different ways then, don't we? And then, as you can see, you then go, we've got all these different structures. But where we've clearly got to in our conversations with the board, and indeed with Claire Harvey, um, is around the reporting that we would be doing into that Safer Suffolk Communities Board. But also that there's a level of delegation that you can give. So when we think about the criminal justice element that you've described, the work with the constabulary, with probation, and all of those factors about enforcement, that's their expertise. They have been doing it and the outcomes and the results they've been getting has been fantastic. So that's the level of expertise there. So some of the work if, uh, around that particular ambition within the drug strategy would be taken within their action plans so that they would be monitoring on, on the behalf of the local drug strategy implementation for Suffolk, but always feeding back into what I'm calling the engine room so that we always see it in the full context of the whole of the drug strategy. So, so what I'm saying is we've got that mechanism as you've described, so let's use it. And because they meet more frequently, because they're monitoring all the time, all the indicators will therefore be brought into that whole basket and then it will be fed back in. Just very quickly, yeah, there have been some, a lot of successes, but I can tell you, well, you, we all know, there's one hell of a lot more to do. Oh, yeah. And it is a real, yeah. real concern of the public yeah. because, as it says in that report, all the other problems it causes, and um, we can't afford to be, I'm not suggesting you're saying this, complacent in any way. There's, it's a huge journey, this. Yeah. It really, really is. Yeah, and all yeah. elements have got to be involved. Yeah, indeed. Thanks. Thank you. Mark, you're next. Thank you, Chair. Um, I certainly welcome the paper, and the additional funding um, can only be welcome, really, for this uh, particular um, issue. I, I've got a question around confidence that we've got the workforce to do this. Um, does it exist? We, we've got a, you know, a real issue in terms of workforce within the NHS, um, and uh, to some degree that could present us with a problem, but to another degree, it could present us with a big opportunity to think differently about what does um, a good outcome look like and how do we achieve that for a long-term issue, not just for a, a treatment programme, if that makes sense. Um, yes, so the workforce has been a key priority for us because we know that within our drug and alcohol treatment service, our caseloads are too, are too high and we have real problems in recruitment and we have problems in retaining uh, staff. So we've been modelling a piece of work around how we make it more attractive to work in Suffolk in that drug and alcohol treatment space. So for that specialist treatment, yes, we're doing a whole tranche of work about bringing up the kind of quality of the um, treatment offer. But we're also looking at the wider system and about who else it delivers against substance use. So we're looking at that place-based approach, working with our local communities. We're currently piloting within two PCNs and um, approach to um, alcohol that is very different. So it's about learning from, from those, putting the building blocks in across the three years. So in the first year, we've got half a, half a million pounds, and then we've got uh, just under a million, and then we've got a million and um, a half. So, so it's about building up that workforce, not just within our acute specialist treatment, but across that wider um, space. And there is something about what the communities can do to identify people with problematic substance use and to develop that relationship to either then support that or bring them into specialist treatment. And then it's about people coming out of specialist 
of treatment? How do we embed them back into the communities in which they live? Because that's how we're going to get that long-term recovery. So that's our thinking. Thank you. Wendy, you are next. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just, it, there's a question about how we report to the board, should we report to this board? And I'm just reflecting on how you started the meeting about the nature of the reports that come to this board, what this board's for, what we talked about in the workshops. And it just feels like this is a place where we can be brave and I think we're going to have to be over the next year about how we do things, how we take risks together. So my only concern was, um, I think for the reports that come to this board, they should, as Arthur, I think, was saying, it's about the impact, the so what. What are the barriers? What are you really struggling with? And how can we unlock those? More than the process of how things are going. And I'm just wondering how that work might work. It's not something you need to answer now, but I think we, we won't have the space to take long process reports. But really key, difficult blockers is exactly where we need to be. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Robert. Yes, my apologies, Sam. Um, again, thank you. It's a, it's a huge area. And um, sitting on the Community Safety Partnership, I have done for many years, um, drugs and alcohol have always been an issue, and there's never really been that link. And, and the other thing I'd say is that possibly mental health, because you know, if you were involved in that area of, of drugs and alcohol, mental health has a huge uh, implication within that. And I know Tim will perhaps reiterate that as well, because he's had to deal with the, the problems around uh, drunkenness and drug-related problems, and often uh, uh, mental health is a problem. I would suggest that this is probably the best place to, to bring your, your reporting back to on the basis that we all sit around here, including James, who's um, children and young people, because of education. Another thing that we need to be, be sure that our young youngsters are aware of the, the, the difficulties and problems are surrounding drugs and alcohol. So, in short, I think probably I'd be very happy to accept your um, suggestion. Thank you. Um, so no one else, no other hands up. So can I just make a suggestion then? Um, so, I mean, Tim, Tim's raised some points, or, and, and, and Wendy as well, and at the start of the meeting we talked about the problem with the agendas here, and, you know, we're getting through so many items in 20 minutes, when actually we could spend a lot further getting into, getting into some of them, and we will need to going forward. So let's start with the Health and Wellbeing Board, but if we feel we're not giving it what it deserves, or we feel it's not working, then I think we can look at how the Communities Board, Safer Communities Board, Safer, is it safer Collaborative Communities Board, is that the full name? I can't remember. Um, Straker Stronger, Stronger Safer Communities Board. Um, anyway, that we could always use them as a sort of almost an, a sort of early, early board where they could sort of get into the great detail with something coming back here. So let's monitor that, but um, I think we'll use this as a starting point and see how, see how it goes. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for that item today. Okay, thank so we're going to move uh, straight on to making ends meet, the cost of living in Suffolk. Um, and I just need to welcome Anna Crisp, who's the consultant in public health, and also welcome Gemma Levy, who's the specialist lead on localities and partnerships. So hand over to you. Thank you very much, Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, do I need to click on the slides? There we go. Um, I actually slightly feel like my work here is done because the conversation that's happened around the board this morning has referenced almost everything I'm going to talk about. So that is a good starting point, I think. What we have tried to do here with the cost of living profile, which I'll just take you through very quick highlights for with a specific Suffolk angle, um, is to give an evidence base. So I would draw board members' attention to the fact that we have a report now on Healthy Suffolk that covers all of this in much more detail, but also a, a live dashboard. I say live, it's as live as we can make it, so the petrol prices that are on there are as of Monday. Uh, some of the other data we get has a longer lag in it, but if you are needing information on fuel prices, employment rates, universal credit, it's on that cost of living dashboard on Healthy Suffolk. So I hope that board members will find that a useful resource. Um, so some very quick headlines. Cost of living, we talked about this at the last board as well. I think it's really clear to state that everybody will be affected by cost of living increases this year. Not just children and families, not just working age adults, 
Older people are definitely also going to be affected. People with particular needs are going to be affected. This is another uh, communal sort of trauma or communal shock, as it were. However, the impact of this will be greatest for those who were already under financial pressure to start with, and I'll explore some of the reasons why that is the case as we go through. Um, inflation is going to exceed wages. That's a, a statement in the House of Commons Library, and that means that many people will be facing a real terms pay cut. And that is not a situation we have been in for a very long time. So that is a, a real change. COVID saw the biggest economic crisis since the Great Depression, and, and quite how those impacts are going to play out through economies around the world is still too early to call. We've seen dramatic supply uh, failures, we've seen all sorts of things, but those things are going on. There's a statement on the um, World Bank website where they're talking about inflation, where they use the phrase, we are seeing a de-anchoring of inflation assumptions. And I read that and I thought, that means they don't know. <laughs> But actually, I quite like that word, de-anchoring, if it is even a word. Um, that's a bit what it feels like. We are in uncharted territory here. We've had a lot of safeguards. We've lived in a low inflation, low interest rate economy for really quite a long time. And I think those assumptions are no longer supporting the way in which we make decisions. So I would just, I'd just share that word for a reason, because it, it resonated with me. Um, so I'll just step through into some more of the detail here. Um, what we are particularly seeing, and we've already talked about this on this board today actually, is that Suffolk has high levels of employment and that has continued and if you look on the uh, live dashboard you'll see that as at December our employment rates were 78%, that's the same as the east of England, considerably higher than England, that's a protective factor but we know we have low wages, this has already been brought up today. The issue of universal credit has always also been brought up and that graph you can see in the bottom right of your screens is what has happened to universal credit since 2016. So, Every area saw a rise in universal credit claimants. We've talked about the issue of people working but being in poverty already. Universal credit can be claimed by those not working and in work. For Suffolk, it is mainly an in work issue. And what is worrying is that we are not seeing a fall off in those claimant rates as yet. So that is going to be important to keep an eye on. Just thinking about work, um, the cost of working has also increased, particularly in terms of fuel. Um, so fuel is now 40p per litre higher than it was in March 2021. And the cost of filling a Ford Fiesta is now £68.75 as of Monday. Um, that's a lot of money. And we are talking about, as Councillor Fleming made the point earlier, we are talking about poverty here, not deprivation. Poverty in the sense of not having enough resources to cover your minimum needs. So all of those things are important. The universal credit particularly high in Ipswich, um, but has risen right across the county, and we now have more than 55,000 people in Suffolk claiming it. Um, poverty premium I've referred to. So this is about inflation. So um, the Office for Budget Responsibility is now stating that inflation is likely to hit a 40-year high with rates of 9% or above by the end of this year. So when I wrote these slides, they were saying it's high and it's going to come down. That peak has now moved out and gone higher. So this is not a problem that's going to resolve itself very rapidly. Um, it's also important to just be aware of this concept known as the, the poverty premium, which means that people on low incomes often pay more for goods and services. If you have to have a payment meter for your gas and your electricity, you pay more per unit of gas or electricity than somebody who doesn't. Um, and given that the lowest, those on the lowest 10% of income spend more than double the proportion of their income on things like housing, fuel and power, price rises in housing, fuel and power hit those people hardest. Um, just talking about housing, this is some data, so this is what's happened to house prices by area. Suffolk is the, the kind of pale blue line and you can see the rocket in house prices that happened during the pandemic. House prices in Suffolk are up over 11% year on year. Um, there's also a, a particular quirk in Suffolk that means that those on the lowest incomes face the sharpest um, housing and rental costs. I'm not going to go into the detail of that at the moment, but if anyone wants to follow up with me, I'm very, well, I'm very happy to do that. We have covered it in the state of Suffolk before, but it, it continues to be a real issue. Um, the energy cap obviously plays into this, the cost of living. Price cap up by 54% on the 1st of April, and they were saying on the news yesterday, going to go higher. So that um, is significant for many. And that is 
directly relevant to my next slide, which is about homes which are off the gas grid. Um, Suffolk has uh, almost 30% of its homes off the gas grid, so this is a real issue for Suffolk. The national average is about 14.3%. We are at nearly 30%. Ofgem has no authority to regulate oil, heating oil prices. So the, the, so the price cap limits that apply to people with gas and electricity do not apply to homes that are heated by oil. So that is a very particular Suffolk issue. We also have issues about our housing stock. We have fewer than the England average of homes that have a, an energy performance certificate rating of C or higher, so our homes are relatively poorly insulated and expensive to heat. And we also have an older housing stock than England as an average, and the age of your property is the biggest indicator of how expensive it's going to be to heat and how efficient it is. So there are some real specific Suffolk issues tied into that issue of fuel poverty. Um, other rising costs people will be well aware of, I'm sure. So ONS data from March says that nine, nearly nine out of ten people were reporting that the cost of living had risen and they were reporting food as the biggest element in those price rises. And that is clearly not an element of discretionary spending. Um, and I think I will... Yeah. So it's an obvious point related a little bit to the poverty premium, similar sort of concept, but those on lower incomes have significantly more of their income going on non-discretionary spending and those are where those, ha those increasing prices are particularly sharp. Um, this is an example which I won't go through the detail of now, it's in the cost of living report. We just thought it might be helpful to bring this down to the level of a family or an individual in Suffolk. Um, so this is a proper worked example with accurate maths of someone who works full time uh, on a, in, in the rents a two bedroom flat, we've said he's in Ipswich. So we've worked through all of the relevant costs and he's left with about, um, is it for the month, 94 pounds a week after fixed costs. Now it doesn't take a great deal of imagination to imagine how that could be swallowed up pretty quickly. I was talking to a friend at work yesterday, he said, oh my fridge freezer's gone bang this morning. You know, that can, that can swallow that up. A set of tires for the car, all of those things. And my point here really is that that is an average. So half the people in Suffolk have less than that in terms of any sort of flexibility of income available to them week in, week out. So you can very quickly see that all the things we've talked about, about energy, house prices, all the rest of it, will eat into that. And many families and individuals in Suffolk are likely to be significantly poorer as a result. They don't have much of a buffer to start with. Um, so quick words in conclusion, because I know you are keen to hear from Gemma. Um, we are, have already seen the cost of living increasing significantly, and that's likely to continue to increase. Inflation is likely to continue to rise. That's going to hit everyone, but it'll hit those with least uh, financial headspace the hardest. Um, I think we're starting to see the trade-off between the cost of living and the quality of living, and councillors have referred already to uh, comments that were made yesterday at scrutiny about that, you know, that we're hearing a lot about eating versus heating and things like that. Uh, that is a national issue, but also very present in Suffolk. Um, and we, need to, we know we need to do more, and that's exactly what Jem is going to talk about. Um, I'm very happy to pause there and take any questions, Chair, or, or would you like me to pass over to Gemma? Thank we'll go you. to Gemma first, just, uh, to, and then we'll come afterwards to questions. Lovely. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for having me. I don't know how I'm going to fit this into five minutes but um, it'll be a whistle stop tour. Um, first off I think I was asked to give a bit of a, uh, an update on the progress that we've made around um, thinking our thinking around addressing poverty and tackling poverty in Suffolk. Um, let's go back to the beginning first and then hopefully I can meet you back where, where Anna left off. Um, we took a significant amount of time to undertake co-production with our communities. Um, we worked with our partner Health Watch to help guide us through that. And we worked with a lot of our VCSE organizations to ask them to help us to design the questions that we wanted to ask people about their experiences of living in poverty. People came back to us via those surveys, via interviews and telephone conversations to tell us what they needed what they thought would help us. They were also able to tell us about the point in time at which they needed help and support. And looking back on, they could tell exactly the point where they needed that information, advice, um, and guidance. That's really powerful when we talk a lot as commissioners about time, place, and good service quality. 
We pulled those views into um, an action plan alongside good practice, alongside research um, that was undertaken nationally and alongside the data. And we also undertook an EIA process. That's great and that was really valuable and that is a point in time because as Anna set out, it's ever changing and that makes it really difficult to get ahead of the curve. We've had to do a lot of crisis management during COVID, after COVID, and we're also trying to do some preventative methods. And I hope that you'll start to see that coming through in the action plan. We have got some of our assets. So as Anna's mentioned, we've got the cost of living dashboard. We've got a needs assessment around poverty, um, looking at national and local data sets. We have a food insecurity profile and we have a dedicated web page which hosts a lot of these uh, a lot of this information and more we have it ma mapped the existing work that's already happening by suffolk county council but we know we need to map further against our vcse organizations and our district and boroughs it shows that there's an incredible amount of work that's going on across system partners and that's really valuable and that shouldn't be missed unfortunately national circumstances, changes, crises that are happening means that we need to do more. And unfortunately, what we are doing is really good, but it's just being superseded by everything else um, that's going on. But there is really good work going on there. In terms of um, our action plans, we had a really good discussion at Scrutiny yesterday, looking at the action plan and strategy, and from that, we have some really valuable comments and recommendations that we'll take back and work up. And, and thank you to everyone that was involved in that because I think it really got us thinking um, a lot more about what we can do. We've already started to undertake a huge amount of work, um, working with our food banks, working with the local welfare assistance scheme, Suffolk Advice and Support Service, our holiday activity um, offer, all of which we mentioned. Um, working with our libraries as well, because we have 45 locations across Suffolk, that's a real in into a lot of our um, rural communities. We've also heard about the work around public mental health and the good work agenda. So there's lots of real um, fabulous work that's already started and working and, and continuing to be developed. But as I said, it's an ever-changing situation. We are, um, we've started the work on the um, poverty strategy and after comments yesterday we need to do a lot more on that and that's, that's good to hear and we hope to have that developed um, as soon as possible. But that strategy focuses on four areas, the emergency support, increasing um, incomes and reducing costs, well-being and life chances and preventing poverty. But as you can see that challenge is huge. So what are our opportunities available to us? hopefully won't be unfamiliar to you. And it would have helped if I brought my glasses today, so um, I do apologize. Um, there we are. Um, so some of those opportunities is to continue to work on those existing pieces and develop it further with your help. We have the county deal and um, the leveling up funding associated. We've got the good work and health offer and the public mental health, all real opportunities that we can utilize. And we've talked a lot about that. Some people have already mentioned about um, how we can link to those going forward and, and I've made a note of them. But our ask is, is to acknowledge the extent at which this exists, to understand that we need to work as a system to drive those actions uh, that will address those root causes of poverty and committing resources to that be open to changing the way that we work so that we can reduce the impact of poverty on people. And one of the key pieces of work that we've got coming out today is a real in-depth piece around, sorry, not coming out today, but we started the work on, is an in-depth piece with Healthwatch colleagues um, around co-production, where we can work with commissioners as well around changing the way that we work to better reflect the needs of our people who have experience of poverty. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, and um, thanks. You obviously had a, a, a busy day yesterday in front of scrutiny and here today, so thank you very much. <laughs> You've had a lot on um, on top of the day job. I appreciate that. So thank you. Um, right, we we'll open it up. Uh, Ed, you wanted to go first. Yeah, and thanks, um, Anna and, and Gemma. Um, it was really helpfully framed earlier about cost of living crisis being the next phase of the pandemic, and I think that's been a take-home message for me today. Um, I wanted to ask about anchor institutions because that's come up 
um, a number of times. I'm concerned we don't have a, a really systematic way of p driving that agenda forward in Suffolk currently. So in Leeds, for example, they've redirected a billion pounds worth of discretionary funding back into local businesses, back into the local community, uh, which, is, which is been fantastic to see. So I, I just wonder, do, do you feel we're having sufficient conversations in Suffolk about keeping the resource we do have locally so that we can benefit local businesses, local people, and therefore, and therefore their health? I think that would be really welcomed. I think we, as we've already outlined, there's some really specific Suffolk issues that we need to work on, and I think that could be really valuable. So discussions around how Anchor institutions can support that would be really welcome. Tim. Yeah, um, thanks both um, Anna and Gemma for the report. I mean, it's in some way, it's quite depressing because there are an awful lot of serious issues here because of um, um, global events and so on. We don't need to go into that. Um, and it is a really, really serious problem. Um, so what can we actually do? Well, there's, it, it, the problem is to me, there's what do you do in the short term? Then there's the longer term. And I've given my views about procurement. I'm glad to see you've got the county deal there. That's a long term, better productivity, um, education, good health care, all of those things. We can work together on that. I suppose in the short term, all I can say is from um, our position, we do support organisations, do a lot for young people, particularly um, in the de deprived area where they've got lack of opportunity to keep going with that. So I can certainly give a commitment term that we will continue with that. It's not going to solve the problem. Um, and I, I think um, that's important. It's quite worrying. I mean, even two or three years ago, there were, I think, was it Positive Futures who had a uh, a function that they were doing for young people during school holiday times up in Lowestoft, um, up in up in the Witten Estate up there, and I was, um, I suppose, almost upset to see that there were young children there who clearly, I mean, certainly wouldn't say they were malnourished, but hadn't got the opportunity um, that most of us in this room, if not all of us, actually realise how fortunate we are. So. It's not directly a, a crime prevention, I'm told, but actually I would argue the other way. Yes, there is, because if you keep young people with a purpose, occupied, and at least reasonably buoyant, then um, for me that's good enough. So we'll keep going on that. But at the other end of the age group, to those who are really old and infirm, um, I don't know what the answer is. I wish I did. Um, all I can say, it sounds a bit soft, but I think this is where the community spirit we did see in COVID, and certainly in a lot of villages, where people looked out for others and did care for those. I think that's quite a powerful thing, and maybe perhaps getting a message across like that, particularly the voluntary and charitable sector and all of us, that will help. And I suspect it's going to be a combination of several smaller initiatives or steps that will help. But it is deeply, deeply worrying. There's no doubt about that. And um, you know, I just don't know what the answer is, I'm afraid. It's not very helpful, but there we go. And, and just to add to that, Tim, a really important point, and I think that's where our community infrastructure is really valuable. Um, our SALC, our BCSE organisations, our libraries, where they are at that very local place, and that's where we really need to um, support them to be able to support those communities. You're right, that, that local element was really valuable during COVID, and if we can enhance some of that again, um, we really need it. Thank you. Uh, Mark. Thank you. Um, just for some context, when, when we were assured as a, um, a CCG, one in five children in Ipswich were thought to be living in po poverty, um, which is going up to one in four. Um, so it isn't a new issue, but it's one that's getting worse and can only get even more worse. Um, with with this uh, with this crisis, um, I, I've just got a, a few things to question. What what can we do to accelerate the sustainability and green agenda that we're all really really um, interested in seeing um, come to the fore? You know, what can we do that would give potentially differential planning discretion and financial support to those who are in this particular situation that might help? fuel poverty? Um, what could we do uh, for our charitable 
uh, sector here in Suffolk who um, only retain something like 30% of the charitable donations that we as a population of Suffolk make. How can we get that um, message out to sustain better support for our local charities? Um, and, and how can we use some of the precedent we have for funding the Police and Crime Commissioner to support differential uh, ways of raising, potentially raising additional money and giving it differentially as a consequence to those areas that we know uh, are deprived. You know, we welcome tourists. We have second homes here. Are we making, could we be making uh, better use of those assets um, and, and what they could potentially bring, but not necessarily where they are, but where we need that um, funding to come to if we're going to support the, the, the level of need that we're going to be seeing. Thank you. Did you want to come back at all? Um, yes and no. <laughs> Can I go away and do some research? Is that okay? Um, I think the, there's certainly some opportunities around with the BCSE organisations and I think around our warm handover offer, get more people signed up to that, making that money move around um, much better. So yes, I think with that, with your other points around energy efficiency, I think there's a lot more, there's a lot of national funding around for energy efficiency and we do tap in really well to that, but we need to do a lot more and we do need a lot more resources to be able to tap into that. Because we have got our Warm Homes Healthy People offer and um, they do a phenomenal amount of work. Um, during COVID, um, some of that work was put on hold because they weren't able to get the um, uh, people into the houses to go and assess the houses naturally. Um, so they've had a bit of a backlog, but they've also seen um, referrals to their service increase um, incredibly. So th there is a lot of work that we need to do there, but there is a lot of national funding that we, we already do and will continue to tap into. Um, in terms of second homes, I'll have to take that one away. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Wendy. Yeah, thank you. And I was just thinking, it's funny, isn't it? It's like after all the things we talked about, this seems to bring all of that together in so many ways. And, and we're delighted to be working um, with Gemma and the team around long-term approaches. But I, like Ed, I was thinking that this is really, when you think of it in terms of the next stage of the pandemic, it really helps to think about why we need to trigger different ways of working. It gives us permission to do that. Um, and, and potentially, too, to be really clear with our public about this is where we are. And, and I think there's a lot of anxiety and a lot, it's a really strange time, isn't it? But once we do that, then perhaps it might help to trigger that community feeling because people really want to help, they just don't know what to do. Um, it might really help with the differential spend and really help us think about that Suffolk pound, that how can we make it better here? So, um, so that would be one really clear recommendation for me that we really are very clear with our public about this is where we are and it's going to be a really difficult year but we're all in it together and we can then sow those positive messages my other suggestion was a practical one um, around our voluntary and community sector um, this is a disaster we can see coming um, and we've got some time i would like to suggest that we might review all of our um, funding agreements with our really key voluntary sector organizations um, some of which come to an end, and I know my colleague won't be able to speak of that because it kind of is her organisation, but there are others where they're to give them some security um, over the next couple of years so that they can start to plan um, because there's nothing worse than facing um, an end of, of funding so that we can plan together. Well, I'll just comment on that last point. I mean, of course, we're in exactly the same boat. We have no idea what our funding is as a county council. We expected a three-year funding. We've had one-year funding. Inflation is at 10%. We had a contract, you know, and, and we're experiencing the same. So I think it's, it's easier said than done because actually we have no idea where our finances are, which impacts the people we fund. So um, I, 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 think, I think that's the difficulty with that at the moment. But once we get clarity in... As a county council, you know, our budget's 625 million. Once we get clarity around our budget, mm. then we can give clarity to others. If we got a three-year settlement, we could give longer-term clarity to others. 
but we're caught up in a much bigger picture. And just something to be on, really honest with everybody about, again, just really clear transparency with everybody about that. And of course, the other thing is there are far more cost pressures now and new cost pressures that maybe we hadn't, you know, that we didn't have to think about previously as well. Um, John, you want to come in? Um, yeah, just a comment really. Um, people talk about the Suffolk Pound. I think the circular economy, local circular economy, is fundamental to, to, to driving the local economy. I was very struck with Mark's comment about 30% of uh, money collected by Suffolk charities only remains in Suffolk. So that's something I certainly want to uh, find more out about. I think from a Chamber's perspective or the business community's perspective, we're perhaps coming at this at a different angle. We're sort of, if it's a, we're coming at it perhaps top down. Uh, we've certainly got uh, grave concerns that the, uh, what is a fragile recovery is being currently choked. We're, we're currently lobbying uh, hard for um, a sort of more supportive fiscal environment that will, will support the cost of living. So certain things we're, 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 we're uh, lobbying at a high level, sort of uh, treasury level around uh, reviewing and delaying uh, things like the national insurance rise, not only hits em employers, but hits employees. Uh, things like uh, cutting VAT on business energy bills. I appreciate that that may not impact the, uh, the community as such, but it certainly impacts people in work because it's about profitability. And certainly things like uh, asking for uh, um, uh, COVID testing to be brought back into the workplace in terms of covered by the government so that we can uh, ensure that more people are in work because one of the key things we need to do is keep our workforce in work because one of our fears is um, unemployment is on the horizon and large unemployment is on the horizon on the back of back of uh, this cost of living crisis. So I think it's an approach that it's not just a local approach, but we're going to be hitting this both top down and, and, and bottom up. But I think as partners, we, we, we must stick together on that and get those messages into those people, uh, members of parliament in particular, who can make those decisions for us as sort of treasury cabinet level. So more of a statement, Chair. Yeah. Thanks, John. And of course, it would have been remiss of me not to have said, going back to our budget, that 70-75% just goes on two areas, which is looking after the most vulnerable children and the most vulnerable adults in Suffolk as well. So, Beck, to, that which leads nicely into Becky. I had to get that in because Becky put her hand up, and I didn't say that earlier. So, Becky. <laughs> Thanks for that segue. <laughs> um, I'm not actually going to talk about adults. Well, I am. Um, I'll talk about housing, actually. And I think um, where we've got... A, great program of work we're doing and how we support and this is I appreciate this is a longer term um, support I think we need to refer to planning and the planning system um, and many years ago as a health and well-being board we signed is it health and housing charter I uh, know I don't know where that ever went <laughs> or what happened to it but um, we need to start looking at a system whereby we're um, developing, and it builds into Mark's point, um, home efficient, um, energy efficient homes, which we are doing, and I know that's part of the planning principles, but homes for lives, um, you know, bungalows, a mixture of housing, affordable housing, that actually helps people have a, um, first of all, get a home, but have a home that they're able to stay in for a period of time without having to keep moving because they just simply can't afford their, their homes as well. So the planning system, um, and, and needs to sort of be into that some of that work on how we can design a community, I suppose, as a sustainable community, um, with all that's going on in the background. Thank, thanks, Becky. I um, totally agree. Um, and, and like most things, some of that's wrapped up in, in some of the national policy and guidance that's set down, but I can't speak for the planning teams, but I do know that they have um, contributed to a lot of consultation, particularly around energy efficiency for new homes, and I know that consultation has gone back. Uh, we're a very pragmatic approach into it, and I don't think we've received the, the, the final outcome of that yet. Um, but I, yeah, totally agree. That is a longer piece of work and something that we do that we do need to to think about. And we do have a really good um, uh, working group with our planning team, with public health, to put that health in all policies to think about. Um, you know, good homes, long-term homes, and, and energy efficiency homes. But yeah, I think we're, we're still a long way off from where we need to be, but it, it's there in the thinking. Thank you. Martin, you just want to come in? Yeah, I think Gemma has picked up the point as well. I, I think we had a presentation from my colleague Mash previously when she talked about the work being done with our 
planning colleagues. Um, uh, yeah, very important that you know, the design elements are in there, but also looking at the sustainability and the efficiency of those as communities that are being built. Um, the other point I would make, though, is that the new build is only a small proportion of the property in the county, and Anna made that point earlier. Uh, and we do really need to look at how we retrofit, how we insulate, how we provide for uh, lower cost and more sustainable options around heating, um, and uh, how, we, how we take that work forward as well. Chair. Yeah, just a, a, a quick point. Um, I mean, the one good thing, I suppose, compared with the, and I can remember, not everybody will, the disastrous decades in, in the 70s, where we had really rampant inflation, enormous interest rates in the early 80s. So we're not there, and we're relatively full employment. But of course, we are struggling in the, in the constabulary. We've got over 90 vacancies at the moment, and I know it happens right across all sorts of other areas. So we've got to really market that well. But I do think, I think it was Mark and John, this national insurance surcharge, and it's it, circumstances have changed since then that was brought in. I do think putting pressure on us for wherever we can to get that either postponed or withdrawn altogether. Just for example, not only is it affecting individuals' pay packets, but for the constabulary budget, which is 161 million quid this year, that's another 1.25 million out the window. And I still don't see how it's going to help the health service because no doubt their employers' overall extra national uh, employers' charge is going to more than it, it deal with that. So, that, to me, it's nonsensical. And it doesn't matter for governments to change their minds. Circumstances have changed. And that would at least help some mitigation. So, I don't know whether there's anything we can do to try and lobby on that. That's always a long short, but that's certainly what I will, I will do. I'll tell our MP he needs to step up to the mark and um, see what he can do about it, for example. And then, I'm very, very nervous about the Bank of England's approach to putting interest rates up again. I'm not sure it's really going to, unless you, if you really want to cut inflation down, you'll have to put it up to 4 or 5%, and that would be a total unmitigated disaster. People's mortgage payments going up, people are already overstretched, particularly first-time buyers, and that adds to it. So, very, very difficult situation to juggle all these balls in the air at the one time. I couldn't do it, but I do think there are a few small steps that might help. It would ease our collective budgets, as well as for individuals, which could give us um, a little bit more resource to see what we could do to help. So there's a sort of logic behind that in, in my view. So I'll, I'll, I'll stick a letter in, but I'm not sure it'll make, make all that difference. I mean, the Chancellor was an Ipswich on uh, earlier this week, Monday, and he did say that, you know, government can't do everything. Uh, and that's the problem they're under as well, I guess. Uh, Carol, you wanted to come in? Yeah, um, I just wanted to say um, thank you for the support of the BCSE sector. I mean, it is greatly appreciated. And um, with the comments that you know Tim was just saying about increase of interest rates and, and everything else, I think we're, uh, we're going to be needed more than ever. But um, a couple of the key things that are really useful for us at the moment is the local welfare assistance scheme. And I think we'd be really lost without that. And that works really well for our clients, and we are using it a lot. And also the support for the food banks as well, because you know people are very reliant upon the food parcels. And um, the warm homes, healthy people, making sure there's su su sufficient resources in that to be able to support clients with their, their energy needs. Thank you. SPSL, um, we topped that up, didn't we? Um, the, the fund uh, matching it from some government funding from memory. Yeah. OK, um, anyone else want to come in? I think I've been through the list. So, um, so can I just check, because I'm always nervous when new boards' names appear. So, so the Poverty Reduction Programme Board actually is a subsidiary working party from... Could you just, just explain that? Because I think when you see names of new boards, everyone's like, where do you get to them? Who are they? How are they going to operate? But it's a, it's a subset, isn't it? Could you just talk us through that quickly, then? Because I know we're pushed for time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Apologies for that. Um, yeah, it's a programme office that's with our district and boroughs and county council um, to look at the actions within the poverty and those actions that are specifically relevant for um, district and boroughs and councils where we have the levers to pull in those spaces so that we can keep a handle on it. What we're going to do, like we've talked about very much here is then use existing groups to help with some of the specific tasks and that's so we're not creating anything new but we needed a, a place to actually just talk about poverty so but it will feed into the collaborative communities board and the health and well-being board. coming out of the collaborative communities board perfect okay good thank you okay any other points for anyone 
No? Okay, well, thank you for that. I mean, I think, you know, we, we know, I mean, everyone's voiced it, haven't they? I mean, it's a great worry. It's a worry for everyone. It's a worry for our residents. It's a worry for the board. It's, um, you know, it is the number one topic that people have been discussed. And actually, it's, it is interesting how we've, you know, all those discussions around COVID, apart from, I think, Gordon Brown just raised it the other day, saying don't get too confident, but, you know, we have moved in, and this is now the big thing that everyone really is just giving that focus to, and rightly so, and we will obviously as well. Okay, so moving on, um, we're happy with the recommendations there, I take it. Um, just moving on, um, there's an information bulletin that's in our papers on page 161, just for information only. Um, what I'll do is, as we've slightly overrun, I won't run through um, anything else anyone wants for future consideration, but if you do want anything on the forward plan, can I just suggest you email it in? Um, so we can have a look at it and get it on there. You've got a copy of what's on there now, but if there's something we've missed, something you think should be on there, please email it in. The next meeting is on the 14th of July. Um, and thank you very much for joining us today. So I officially close the meeting at uh, 12.45. Thanks very much.